Good evening and welcome to tonight's meeting of the Planning Commission. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Mr. Pruder to explain the procedures for the public to uh, speak tonight first. Good evening, Chair Doran, uh, Planning Commissioners and members of the public. At this Planning Commission meeting, uh, we are uh, discussing specific protocols for communicating. And to start with, the Planning Commissioners will have their webcams on during the duration of the Planning Commission meeting. For those presenting on an item in tonight's agenda, we ask that you also turn on your microphone and your webcam during your presentation for your item. A member of staff will assign you keyboard and mouse controls if you are displaying a presentation for your project. We then kindly ask that you turn off your webcam and microphone when done with the presentation portion of your item, unless called upon by the chair. During the public comment period, members of the public will have an opportunity to share their comments or questions by clicking on the hand icon on your screen, the Zoom interface, or by um, using on their telephone, the buttons star <coughs> nine. And with either of those prompts, staff will allow you an opportunity to provide public comment for this specific item. And also for any members of the public who are sharing a Zoom account or phone line with multiple um, commenters this evening, please inform staff at the start of your item uh, indicating that you have someone else on your line that would like to provide a public comment and we will ensure that the other commenter or commenters are given an opportunity to provide public comment as well when you have finished your um, comment. So with that said, I hand it back to you, Chair Dorn. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm gonna call the roll now. I will ask the commissioners to respond verbally so we can uh, note their presence uh, in the transcript. Um, Commissioner Barnes. Good evening. McCarty. Good evening. Harris. Good evening. Kennedy. Good evening. Riggs. Good evening. Tate. Good evening. And me, we have a full house tonight, all seven commissioners present, thank you. Um, first item on our agenda is reports and announcements. Uh, Ms. Sandemeyer, do you have anything for us? Yes, good evening, Chair Dorn and commissioners. Um, so tomorrow the city council will be considering an urgency ordinance to continue the downtown street closure program. Um, which will continue to allow businesses some outdoor operations. Um, that concludes my updates, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Do you have any questions from the commission for Ms. Sandmeyer? Not seeing any. Um, I'm gonna move to public comment. Uh, under public comment, the public may address the commission on any subject not listed on the agenda and items listed under consent calendar. Each speaker may address the commission once under public comment for a limit of three minutes. Please clearly state your name and address or political jurisdiction in which you live. The commission cannot act on items not listed on the agenda, and therefore the commission cannot respond to non-agenda issues brought up under public comment other than to provide general information. And I would like just to remind people that you will have a chance to speak later in this uh, evening's meeting on individual items that are on our agenda. This is only for items not on the agenda. Uh, Mr. Pruder, do we have any hands raised for public comment? Thank you, Chair Doran. At this time, I don't see any hands raised, but just as a reminder for the public uh, to please press the hand icon if you're using the Zoom interface on a uh, device at the moment, and we will uh, give you an opportunity to provide public comment. And alternatively, if you are calling in by phone, you can press star nine and we will see that as a hand raised as well. And I don't see any at the moment. We can still wait another moment if you'd like. Yeah, we can give them a few seconds. Great. No hands. I see no hands. Um, thank you, Chair Dorn. Okay, I'm gonna close public comment, move to the consent calendar. The only items still on the consent calendar are the approval of minutes. Uh, the approval of minutes and court reporter transcript from the November 15th, 2021 Planning Commission meeting and the approval of minutes from the November 22nd, 2021 
Planning Commission meeting. Does anyone have any corrections or additions to the minutes that would require us to take them out of the consent calendar? Chair Doran? Yes. Uh, I, I need to, yes, to poll E1. Okay. Um, no others, no one on E2. Okay, I guess we will go ahead and vote on the consent calendar for item E2 then, and then we can take your comments on uh, item E1. So uh, approval of the consent calendar, which now consents, con consists only of the minutes from November, 20, uh, November 22nd, 2021. Uh, Commissioner Barnes. Yes. Oh. So I have a hand raised from Commissioner Riggs. You've got your mute on. I was going to move to approve. Do I have a second? Commissioner Kennedy's indicated she is seconding the motion. Uh, Commissioner Barnes. Uh, yes. Riccardi? Yes. Harris? Yes. Kennedy? Yes. Riggs? Yes. Tate? Yes. And myself. Uh, so on a 7 0 vote, the uh, consent calendar is approved. Uh, Commissioner Riccardi, did you want to uh, explain your uh, issues with the uh, minutes? Yeah, this is, yeah, this is pretty straightforward. It's on page 12. In the middle of page 12, it says uh, that at this point in the meeting, Commissioner Tate seemed absent. Um, and that seemed like a point of fact and not conjecture, number one, and seemed kind of unfair to Commissioner Tate. Uh, so I, I would ask that staff, and maybe we can do that right now, could clarify whether Commissioner Tate was present or absent for that portion of the meeting. If I recall correctly, I stated that I was leaving the meeting. Great. In that case, could we correct the minutes to note that Commissioner Tate left the meeting? Thank yes. you, Commissioner and, Tate. And I, yeah, because I previously said I needed to leave by a certain time. Okay. Um, Ms. Sandmeyer is nodding her head. So uh, I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes with that correction. Uh, I'll move approving with that correction. Do I have a second? Mr. Kennedy is seconding the motion. Okay, um, I'll move to a vote on it. Uh, Commissioner Barnes? Yes. Mr. Riccardi? Yes. Commissioner Harris? Abstain. Commissioner Kennedy? Yes. Commissioner Riggs? Yes. Mr. Tate? Yes. I'll vote in favor as well. So the minutes with that correction are approved on a vote of six yes, one abstention. The next item on our agenda is a presentation item. This is a presentation for a master plan by Signature Development Group and Peninsula Innovation Partners, LLC, on behalf of Meta Platforms, Inc., formerly Facebook, Inc., at 1350 1390 Willow Road, 925 1098 Hamilton Avenue, and 1005 1275 Hamilton Court. Receive a presentation on the proposed Willow Village mixed use master plan development. This presentation would allow for the planning commission and members of the community to learn more about the proposed project. The proposed master plan would comprehensively redevelop an approximately 59 acre existing industrial research and development, R&D, and warehousing campus with up to 1,730 housing units, up to 200,000 square feet of retail uses, up to 1,600,000 square feet office campus for Meta, formerly Facebook, consisting of up to 1,250,000 square feet of office space and the balance, i.e. 350,000 square feet if office space is maximized of accessory space in multiple buildings, a 193 room hotel and publicly accessible open space, including an approximately 3.5 acre publicly accessible park. The proposal includes requests for an increase in height floor area ratio, FAR, and density under the bonus level development allowance in exchange for community amenities. The proposed project 
also includes the realignment of Hamilton Avenue and an elevated park to connect the main project site with the Bellhaven Neighborhood Shopping Center. The project would also consider reconstruction of an existing service station at 1399 Willow Road and an approximately 6,700 square foot expansion at the Bellhaven Neighborhood Shopping Center as a future separate phase. The main project site encompasses multiple parcels zoned OB office and RMUB residential mixed use. The gas station and shopping center parcels are zoned C2S neighborhood shopping restrictive. We have a staff report on this item, uh, which was continued from the January 10th meeting. Um, the staff report is by Mr. Parada. Uh, I will ask Mr. Parada if he's got anything to add to the staff report. I do want to note for the record before I do that, uh, that I have met with the uh, developers and with the Meta staff, uh, both in person pre-COVID and more recently on Zoom calls regarding this matter. I don't think it would affect my impartiality on anything to come before the commission. Mr. Parada. Thank you, Chair Doran and members of the commission. Uh, so tonight before the planning commission is a presentation item. This is an opportunity for the applicant team to provide a presentation to the planning commission and basically reintroduce the project to the commission as well as community members. Um, so as, as part of that, we'll move quickly into the applicant's presentation. Um, I'll keep my remarks here very brief. A uh, couple of things to note, since the publication of the staff report for the January 10th meeting, from which the item was previously uh, scheduled and continued, we have received four additional items of correspondence. Those have been forwarded separately to the Planning Commission. Um, as part of just a quick update on the project, so we're in the environmental review development phase, as well as the plan review phase. Um, as the staff report notes, this is a presentation and opportunity to reintroduce the commission. Um, and then as part of the next steps, we intend or are planning to uh, release the draft EIR at, at some point in the near future, uh, likely the uh, first quarter of this year. Um, so this really gives the planning commission and the community an opportunity to learn more about the project in advance of the release of the draft EIR. As we mentioned in the report, uh, as part of the draft EIR comment period, there will be a public hearing and a study session associated with that public hearing. On the, there'll be a draft EIR public hearing, excuse me, and a study session for the Planning Commission to discuss the project in more detail at that time. This really should be looked at as a presentation, an opportunity to learn more about the project, receive the presentation. Uh, it, it should not be a detailed discussion that you would see in a typical study session. Um, so with that concludes my remarks. Happy to take any questions. Um, otherwise, I'll turn it over to the applicant team. Uh, Chair, Chair Doran, you're on mute. Thank you. Um, I did have a question actually. Uh, what's the significance of this being a presentation as opposed to a study session? Is there a limit on the number of study sessions we can we can do? Is that the reason this is not a study session? So for, for this project, there wouldn't be a limit on the number of public meetings uh, or study sessions. Uh, this is really intended as a presentation um, since we will have a present uh, study session, excuse me, with the uh, alongside the draft EIR. Um, as a presentation item, it's, it's really more of a one-way communication from the applicant. The planning commission can certainly ask clarifying questions, but discussion should be limited with it being a presentation item. Uh, as part of a study session item attached to the draft EIR public hearing, staff will do a more robust analysis of the project as well and, and provide that analysis alongside the draft EIR analysis for the uh, the commission's consideration. Does that kind of help clarify? That does help. Um, does anyone else have clarifying questions for Mr. Parada before we go to the presentation? Okay, I'm not seeing any, so uh, the applicant can take it away. Thank you. Um, this is Mike Gilmetti with Signature Development Group. Can, can everyone hear me? Great, thanks. So, uh, well, first off, I want to say we're very excited to be here. Um, and from our perspective, uh, as it relates to the presentation, we've made a lot of changes since I think we were here uh, for an initial study session in 2019, which seems forever ago with the pandemic around. And uh, between all that's happened in the world and all that's happened in the project, we thought it'd be nice to just touch base with you again. Um, we hope that the EIR 
uh, draft EIR will be released uh, as um, as Kyle said earlier, or sometime in the uh, first quarter here, and certainly spend uh, more time with you as Planning Commission to get your thoughts, comments, and questions. So with that, uh, I just want to reintroduce Willow Village. Uh, it's a project we've been working on for uh, several years with Meta. Um, the vision for this in the future, as you can see here, is something where um, uh, it's 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 you know, for people uh, and it, it's not auto dominated, uh, it's, it's not building dominated. This is a place where people can hang out. You have places for cars, you have places for bikes, you have places for people to, to stroll uh, and you have people to, to uh, places for people to, to recreate and eat and, and enjoy the, uh, the scenery and the good weather. Um, this is an, uh, 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 an ideal scene that, that we like to create, but to get there, we had to go through a lot of studies along the way. Uh, See if this works, thank you, oh, there's a delay. Um, so just to kind of go back to what, what we have now, the, the site right now is about 59, 60 acres. Um, there's about a million square feet of, of old uh, buildings that are here. Um, there's about 3,500 uh, Meta employees um, that are here, obviously not so much the last year or so, but in general. Um, and those folks uh, have one point of ingress and egress right here. Um, so it's not the most ideal place in terms of connectivity uh, or flow. Um, it's also not the most, uh, uh, it's not the best place for sustainable buildings, for resilient buildings uh, or attractive buildings, um, and nor is it a really good use of the land. The, these are the buildings that are there now. Uh, so we, in the journey from where we'd like to go and where we came from, a lot happened. So first, Meta took the opportunity to listen to the general plan updates uh, in the beginning of the or the middle of the teens, um, and then took an opportunity to create some initial concepts to submit to the city uh, in mid-17. Um, and then uh, we came aboard uh, in, in, in 2018 uh, to take a lot of the feedback that was given to Meta in that 2017 period, uh, and just from uh, discussions with stakeholders. So we engaged thousands of residents uh, and stakeholders uh, over hundreds of meetings and created a new plan um, from that initial concept in early 19. Uh, we came before you as a planning commission uh, in mid 19 as well. Um, and, and from that point took again, further engagement and feedback, resubmitted a plan uh, in 2020. And that's really what I, we wanted to chat with you about. Again, all through 2020, uh, we had to change the way we did our outreach through a lot of Zoom meetings, uh, small and large uh, community meetings, one-on-ones, et cetera. Um, but we figured out how to get it done and actually engage a, a ton of people. So um, in 2021, we've just kind of uh, uh, firmed that down and, and, and did more uh, detailed architectural submittals. But the, the concept was we listened to folks and this is what they had to say. Uh, first and foremost, and I think several of the folks in, on the Planning Commission said the same thing, do what you can to minimize traffic, uh, improve the connections and connectivity with the surrounding neighborhoods, especially Bellhaven, uh, do a better job with the jobs housing balance, um, increase the amount of housing and in particular the amount of affordable housing. And uh, this we heard a lot from the Bellhaven neighborhoods, uh, deliver the, the promised neighborhood services faster. There's a grocery store and other neighborhood retail and services. Uh, don't wait till the last phases for that. Bring it on as fast as possible because this neighborhood is, has been without for a while. And also provide more open space and the type of open space we can get into in a bit too, because people were quite clear about that. So that's what people said. And here's a little bit what we did with it. Um, from the plan in 2019 to the subsequent plan that we'll show you here tonight, we reduced the amount of office space and the employee capacity by uh, 30%, 30% um, uh, reduction of office traffic, uh, which created a better jobs housing balance. We also increased the amount of both total housing and uh, within that, the affordable housing. We, paid, we, we created, which I'll show you in a minute, uh, 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 better direct connections uh, with Bellhaven, which is our, our neighbor uh, and part of the community um, and uh, accelerated the, the, the grocery store into phase one. Uh, we improved and increased the size of the town square and we added a lot more open space trails and gardens. And what that looks like here is something like this. Certainly we created connections uh, to and from Bellhaven. We created better connections within to the other 
campuses, the meta campuses, classic campus and, and the uh, 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 MPK 2021. We created better connections between the mixed use and the residential areas, the office and the residential. And again, from that one point of, of uh, ingress and egress, uh, we now have several points of ingress and egress all around the project. We have um, above ground connections, uh, below ground connections and at grade connections. And what that looks like here is something like this. This is the plan that the Planning Commission looked at and the community looked at in 2019. And I'll get to some close-ups uh, in a minute. But it fundamentally had the office section over here, uh, the mixed-use section over here, uh, including hotel and, and parks. And the, the streets, uh, I think, are very similar to what, we shared, or what I showed at the very beginning. And that human concept of being able to ride your bikes or walk or drive and navigating very pedestrian friendly. We kept those, but we've, we've, we've changed some of the dynamics. So uh, you can see here that the office area is much smaller and I'll get to it in a second. We added a, a large, uh, almost like a high line, but, but an, an overhead park um, and meeting and collaboration space that Facebook, excuse me, that Meta could use uh, and could share with the community at large. In close up, you can see the kind of color here area here. Um, you still have the campus area here, but it's really confined to more of this area. You have meeting and collaboration space, and you've got this beautiful uh, uh, elevated park that connects um, the entire campus and that they're open to all members of the public. Uh, the town square is still there, it just got bigger. We've got mixed use and residential hotel, and we still have the parks. And in, in, in a, a, a close up area here, you've got an area that is got this main street, which you saw at the very first slide um, that connects the traditional quote unquote Silicon Valley campus was very, very closed. And certainly uh, Meta needs to have a, a secure campus here for security reasons and, and otherwise, but it functions more like a downtown where even in your, your downtown, you may have uh, an office space uh, up top, whether it's a you know professional offices or you know architects or photographers or whoever, uh, but you've got very very public ground floor space, and that's the idea and intent here. Paul's going to get into that in a second, um, but this is now a stitched together uh, campus uh, with this main street, with the the uh, retail, the grocery store, uh, pharmacy, and others, hotel, um, and the connectivity. So we have both the a uh, tunnel. Uh, down below here, as I mentioned earlier, that, that will connect uh, both pedestrians, bikes, and the uh, meta trams that go between campuses. Uh, the overhead park, um, which also provides beautiful views of the refuge uh, beyond and connects uh, people uh, in the Bellhaven community. So a lot of these uh, were uh, worked on for a couple of years. Uh, we're very, very excited about it. Um, we spent a lot of time with the community and um, what that leads to is a, is, a, is, a, is a community where we can create uh, what they call placemaking opportunities. And so with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Paul Nieto uh, from our, our shop. We, can we have him share the screen? Oops. I've, I've got control of it now. Um, th thanks, Mike. I'm just going to go back to the overall uh, and, and thank you, commissioners, for this for, for the time um, to describe this. What I'd like to do is uh, is just uh, talk about a couple of things before I get into more specifics to uh, to give you a little idea of a of a walking virtual tour we're going to take through the campus um, because it's this is a one of kind of development that really hasn't been done anywhere to, to try to uh, blend a tech campus, which largely have been standalones, very secure, almost like um, a military base with um, a, a community. And so we, we base that community around a town square and a main street and connections to neighbors um, and have evolved through a series of, of meetings with our, with our neighbors to, to refine this plan. and. Um, because um, it is pretty special. Uh, I just wanted to highlight a few things that um, relative to open space that, you know, uh, this all came from, from talking to, to you all is uh, we had a, just an acre and a half uh, town square 
with an elevated parking structure. People said we want more open space and, and, and less visible cars. So we've, we've planned some significant underground parking throughout to, to service our, our retail and uh, office visitors, hotel visitors, and uh, grocery um, is actually uh, ground floor. But uh, that gave us another almost acre and a half in the town square. And then we decided to add this elevated park. As Mike mentioned it's, it's similar to say the High Line in, um, in New York City. And this is another, just a tad over two acres of additional open space that will bridge Willow Road and connect once again to, to, to our neighbors. So I wanna start with just the, our edge condition here, things like arrival experience and the like, and then I'm, we're gonna take a little tour walking through these buildings. Oops, I, I clicked before I wanted to. Um, and uh, oops, I'm going the wrong direction. Um, and then um, I, I just wanted to highlight the, the original, the current Hamilton Avenue comes into the parcel right here. And um, Meta negotiated with the Chevron station, which sits at that corner to relocate them further south. And that required, uh, it's required a lot of work, but it really allows us to bring our neighbors right into the heart of the development, the town square and the like. I will mention a few things um, in my presentation about arrival experience and what I call the aha experience. It's not a technical term, but it just sort of means uh, when you come into an area and you see a few of the, of the uh, improvements, you go, oh, I, I kind of get what they're doing here. So uh, uh, on the edge of Willow Road, one of the things we wanted to do is be welcoming from, from, from the, the, the Bellhaven neighborhood, not only from Hamilton, but also if they're coming up Ivy, which Ivy's down here. Um, and so we wanted to lead off with, with a park. It, it's sort of a decompressing feel and an invitation into the neighborhood. So rather than buildings, which are there right now, let's bring some open space, some green space in a way that can really make it special. We've oriented our buildings in a way to break up their massing so that right across the street here, by the way, Midpen is doing some four, uh, building four story units. We wanted to have a, a comparable scale, but also heavily landscaped and orientation of our buildings and the like to, to soften that edge and highlight some of the things like the park. And then our, our main street and hotel um, tying into Hamilton Avenue is, is key as well as the um, elevated park. And then Mike mentioned that the tunnel, this will be a heavily used bicycle tunnel um, as people come from all over to go through that and up into the regional bike trail. And we're real excited about how that could do that. And later on, I will talk about um, the, uh, uh, some of the paseos we've built. So we'll start out with a walking tour coming up the grocery store to retail. Then we're gonna go a little, a little virtual tour of town square, get up on the elevated park, and then come down into the retail main street and, and show you this. And then we, I'm going to give you a tour of the residential street feel that we've been trying, working hard to create and then finish up with open space, the loop, loop trails and, and finalize with the park. So that's, that's the, uh, the, tour, the tour map uh, we're headed to. So this is the beginning of the tour. We're gonna start at the grocery store and then come down to our first retail block, move over to the town square, and then to Main Street, as I said, uh, as we're going. And a key part of this whole, to make this a special place is what we consider placemaking. And that is this ground floor experience. The first 20 feet of, of buildings and uh, need to be in a human scale, welcoming wide sidewalks, texture in, in streets, and, um, and landscaping. But one thing that we'll, uh, I just wanna to touch on also has to do with uh, uh, parking for retail. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that, but, it, but we've made that uh, hopefully very simple to get to, but yet not a lot of cars on the street because we, we're getting them in the, in the garages off the street. Um, so here's our, here's our beginning of our walking tour coming across from Bellhaven this way. Um, wanted the market and this block to be very welcoming with high glass, but also um, warm colors. We want this to feel exciting, but and, and uh, 
and very warm. What I wanted to point out is on the very right-hand side, right here, is the, is the entrance to the parking garage if you're heading north um, uh, on Willow Road. Pull right in, and then they'll actually have surface parking to access the market. So that's really easy. And if it's a, and, a, and on really high high peak days, you'll go up a level too. The uh, the garage is planned to have elevators for um, grocery carts and things like that. But the idea is you you bring us bring into this neighborhood in a really special, welcoming feel. Um, this is the our our idea of the of the uh, grocery offerings. It's uh, with high ceilings. It's, uh, you know, it, we want it to be a very enjoyable uh, full service grocery experience um, with, with ceilings and, and light that uh, almost is like a showroom. So heading up the street, you can see that we've got a colonnade here. And if you turn the corner around the market, there's this, this colonnade continues and there'll be a lot of the, the, the markets uh, outdoor eating and outdoor uh, activities. But and the ground floor across on the next street heading towards the office campus, by the way, in town squares to the left, that's at our very first intersection. But where you see the blue awnings, these will be various retail establishments. Over time, these, you know, the color of the awnings you know, might change, but we wanted to give an idea of, of what will be there potentially uh, restaurants, boutiques. This area here, we're planning as entertainment space. Uh, this could be a cinema, so there may be a, some marquees and thing here for that, or it could be another type of uh, entertainment. But we're talking to those folks right now as, as we move forward. Um, I talked about the arrival experience, and now the, the next slide is the beginning, of, excuse me. And, so, and this is the idea of, our, of, of how we want this to feel, gathering spots for people in little in, in locations that uh, that feel comfortable, little little niches here and there, uh, but all blending together to create a, a special experience. Um, this is what I, I talk about as the beginning of the AHA experience. You're looking from basically across the street from the grocery store. So this, this intersection will have the hotel on the left, um, our little retail eatery that is in the town square, um, the other retail that we just talked about is to the right. So all, we're all, all on this intersection, you see that you'll, in a sense, you do a quick spin, the grocery store, restaurants, entertainment, um, another little eatery, the, the hotel and the town square with our uh, uh, atrium uh, for the meeting collaboration space. So we're gonna take a little tour of the, the town square right now. Um, and the first one is, We've now walked into that little eatery pavilion at the south side of the, and we're looking across this as so it, and so you're having a sandwich or a burger or falafel, whatever it happens to be in here, um, and enjoying the, uh, the, the this, this cool thing. If you look at the very top, you'll see uh, wisteria, and, and we intend to do that along the hotel as well, and um, and you'll see some of this uh, how the landscape being has been thought about it being uh, somewhat consistent and, and complementary as you move through the, through the uh, community. We're actually, in, a, in the next slide, we're gonna step out into the uh, town square itself and take a look at the hotel. And then the one after that, we're actually gonna go up these stairs and look at the elevated park. So here we are in the middle of the town square, looking um, back to the west. And, and the hotel, and here's the wisteria I was mentioning earlier, uh, pavers, and, and uh, we've, we've had comments about um, making sure that these are uh, accessible with people who might be I mean, easy to walk on, people who might be wearing uh, heels and things like that. And, and we're, we're taking all of those comments in as we fine grain this, but I just wanted to pass that on because that is a, a comment we've gotten from the community and we take those uh, comments very seriously. This structure I wanted to point out is, an, is um, oh, and the town square is right on top of uh, subterranean parking. This is one of the elevators that'll come up from the subterranean parking. The, the one I pointed out in the last slide is another one. So we have great access and there's another elevator coming up right next to this building. Um, so people can come up and, and easily shop, easy, easily walk around, easily visit. The hotel has a neat little 
bridge that will go over to the elevated park and their recreation and pool area will be up um, in this level. So creating a cool, vibrant sense of, uh, of space and various um, um, experiences. And then uh, a bike, one of the bike paths will go right across here and then over to the tunnel, which is right over here on the right-hand side. Now we're, now we're gonna head up to the elevated park um, right by that, that uh, stairwell I was talking about and looking once again, the same direction to the west. And you can see it get its width. It, it'll range between 80 and 55 feet as it meanders. Um, and it's about a quarter mile long and will be access, has access on, on both ends. So um, the community will really be able to enjoy that as well as take strolls through the other parts of um, the surrounding neighborhoods and then the, this project and get some great uh, steps in, if you will. But it's set up and, and we'll have a master plan that we will share with you in various rooms and activities, some for kids, some for contemplation, but also providing a spot for bikes as well as um, footpath meandering and, and a variety of, of landscaping that we will be tying into the community and, and, and highlighting nature preserves and things that are just uh, to the north of us. I'm waiting. Um, so the, the next thing we're gonna take down to uh, is that something that's so unique, it's the street experience of the retail and the office campus. You've seen a highlight of it um, before in, in Mike's presentation, this is one of, our, one of our key graphics, but this is Main Street. And the front of this right here are office buildings, which I'll show you in, the, in our next slide. But it's gonna, it's a seam, what we're hoping providing a seamless feel of retail that is in the mixed use. These are residences over here across from offices. We've designed a main street with pavers and narrow lanes, limited parking to slow traffic down. We want cars to feel uncomfortable here so that it's a pleasant strolling, biking, um, walking um, experience. And you can see the proximity to the town square from this out on along Main Street. So it's uh, it, this is one of the, the key spots where you almost see everything together. One of the, and, and why I brought this other local offerings is we'll have retail on both sides of the street that we intend to be complementary. We have a real bias to try to find local um, purveyors of services, whether it's salons, um, bakeries, other goods, coffee houses, and the like. We, we feel that gives it, uh, um, you know, sometimes the, the local offerings and, and the eclectic um, variety of, of cuisines give a place a real sense of uh, authenticity uh, without being faked. Um, this is um, the, the main entrance to the office. This is a building that is along that, if you go to the left, it's the town square. There are the ground floor retail and the town square. And one of the main um, visitor entrances to the office campus. Uh, this is Main Street, as you can see the pavers I mentioned. Um, and that view looking that we just had, looking up towards town, town square is basically you would be sitting right just to the right, right here, looking in that direction. Want to point out the architecture is, uh, we think is, pretty special, kind of a uh, um, very California vibe in ways, but it's uh, CLT timber. This is a uh, um, cross laminated wood that is uh, a, a really special type of construction that um, Meta wants for its office campus. And we think it's will, will likely be the largest CLT timber campus um, in the country when it's completed. And it's a, a real special environmentally sensitive um, uh, uh, building material, but also just gives a tremendous feel for visitors and employees of that, that the, the warmth of the wood and how it well it'll complement the, the necessary steel for seismic upgrades and, and uh, appropriately placed concrete and other things gives it a real special feel for, uh, for everyone. And we're going to move down the street just a little here and uh, down Main Street to the south and see one of the other buildings and the idea of um, 
where the retail is. We don't have any signage up because we don't know exactly who our tenants might be, but you can see the little outdoor rooms we've created around what will be uh, our retail establishments. And back here, there was these little courtyards and we're, we're planning to, in a sense, where Meta has, you've seen Meta bikes everywhere, where have places where they can park their bikes that still keep our, our main street uh, open and clear and, and feeling very vibrant. And we're moving when we're moving continually a little bit south here. Um, and I, I just wanted to point out the entire campus, this is just not the, the office, but the entire campus is uh, going to be built with, with key sustainable goals. Lead Gold, which is what the, the city envisioned when they did Connect Menlo, which we support. Um, all electric, uh, there'll be extensive photovoltaics throughout the project and, and particularly on the uh, parking structures and, and the, uh, but every building will have photovoltaics. We're uh, working with uh, West Bay to provide recycled water for all of the campus buildings. And particularly like in residential, they'll be used for toilet flushing and things like that. But then the recycled water will be used on uh, um, for irrigation. And um, based on our conversations, we're hoping the plant size will not just service the Willow Village, but provide opportunities for the rest of Menlo Park to enjoy recycled water um, uh, up to the size of the plant. Right now, I believe the only reclaimed water recycled is, is at the Sharon Heights Golf Course. Um, the sustainable building materials will be used throughout and including the, the CLT timber, which is great for carbon sequestering. And here's an example of it on our next slide of the, the carbon use in a conventional structure versus the, uh, um, the CLT timber. So that's just an example of some of the things that we're gonna be doing to uh, try to help the environment. Next, I'm gonna take us on a, a little tour of, of how we um, are thinking about the retail. I wanted to show this map again to just reorient where we were. We came up this street, did it, came through this building, up to the elevated park and then down to the, our, our main street, the main office entrance, and then these two buildings. So now it's gonna be, how did we think about the residential streets and how do they in, interact with each other and connect the neighborhoods um, in ways? And so this is how we started to think about it. We've got obviously the, the main street connections that border our mixed use community and then and with Park Street, but what's really neat is we've got a, a very cool community park in town square that almost anchor both sides of the property. And it's really only two blocks from each other. And they're very, they'll be visib visibly linked with some great landscaping and the like. Um, so th with the street feel, we've got extra wide sidewalks and the like, but we've got kind of a West Street feel. We've got a Main Street feel. And then in the center, we, we're focusing on a lot more residential feels. So there won't be retail along our center street and what we call East Street right now. So to, to give a feel with, with stoops and the like. So you still have the, the, what we're hoping is a seamless blending of office and mixed use retail and residential, but also there are a couple of spots where it's, you know, for the most part, kind of a pure residential feel, and yet still highlighting the connections to parks and the like. So here's a couple of examples of that feel. This is actually along Park Street, which is one of our, our, one of our new streets that Mike was talking about in terms of our access, and how we're gonna use stoops and balconies and landscaping. And we'll have this on virtually every one of those residential streets in different forms. The ones on Center Street, which you will see shortly when the, uh, when the draft EIR comes out are, are, pretty, are pretty cool. Um, and uh, we, we look forward to sharing with you those renderings in our, in our next presentation. As we move um, down here, one of the things that the community told us very early is we wanted a senior affordable housing, that demand for senior units, and particularly um, in, in the surrounding community of Bellhaven is uh, there, there's a lot of, um, of potential elder, elderly people who, uh, 
who could use the affordable housing. And so we are um, working with Mercy Housing, and this is a, um, a dedicated senior building uh, for affordable housing. And just for the, for the commissioners and the public to know, um, to comply with, with federal fair housing laws, if you are going to age restrict uh, units, they have to be in a, in a contained building uh, rather than uh, spotted in uh, throughout buildings like the rest of our affordable housing will be in, in, uh, in what are called inclusionary units. This is, will be a standalone building um, dedicated to seniors. And then with architecture that you won't be, you can't tell that this is uh, a dedicated affordable project. And it'll have all sorts of great services for the seniors. The ground floor uh, will have a lot of their meeting rooms and the like, and this is a uh, depiction of what that ground floor will look like. There'll be no residences on the ground floor, but we've got a colonnade here for and wide sidewalks for, you know, sunshade, rain shade, um, and just just a good experience. Um, on the on the uh, east side here is a little dog park, and on the west side, as they continue on, will be our community park. So we think it's a, a great location for the, for the seniors and a great amenity to have a more of a broad spectrum of age throughout our, our community. We really like that concept. This is um, another idea of our, our ground floor um, street frontage. This building sits right at the corner of, of uh, Willow and Park. Part of that arrival experience, you've just passed the, the park and this is the first building uh, that you see. And so we've, we've worked at this also with the extra side uh, wide sidewalks, um, the stoops, um, balconies and the like. So we have eyes on the park across the street over here. And, um, and we've articulated it in a way to you know, feather you into the community as you start heading to slightly taller buildings. Um, also with warm inviting colors and textures. As you made that turn, this is the next building you would get to on which is adjacent to the community park. And this is a, um, a mixed, um, and this is a market rate building that will have uh, some inclusionary affordable housing in it. But we wanted this, to, both of these are things to create that arrival experience that I was talking about. And then with the community park, and we think um, elegant, um, architecture that isn't too imposing um, along with that park give you a part of the aha experience of coming in on the southern side of this development um, so okay now I'm starting to get what this place is about that you sort of had when you when you made that turn at the north on Hamilton and came across the town square um, the next I'm going to take you to we have some uh, open space that's really neat. This is the East Loop bike path Paseo, um, office campus to the left, but a richly lush uh, experience that we want people to, in a sense, be able to get on this bike path and in a sense, forget that they're in this, um, uh, in this more dense community, but it's just a, a little respite. And this will continue on um, it's it's almost a mile, well, excuse me, about a little over half a mile long. It, this goes on the edge of the property to the north side, and then you cut over um, by the meeting collaboration center in that atrium and go to, go into the, uh, you can either get on the elevated park or you can keep going through the tunnel and to uh, your bike, uh, your bike day along the bayfront, uh, which I think that's kind of neat. You've already seen this. Um, slide, but I wanted to point out here, this is also a bike paseo that runs all along Main Street and connects down to O'Brien and then winds around Town Square, connects up with that other bike path that you just saw and goes through the tunnel. We think this is something that's very special. It's a little bit more European, if you will, in, in that we're sharing a, a nice wide um, uh, bike path with a Main Street where we've tried to really limit the, uh, the amount of traffic. And then lastly, um, in completing our open space um, is the idea of the community park. And this is, 
this design is um, is for illustrative period uh, purposes only, but it's uh, it's taking shape uh, through a, a variety of meetings we've had. We had four community meetings, and we've continued to have more private meetings. But we had large community meetings where we took polls and asked people what kind of things they want to see in a park, and um, kind of universal universally they wanted to see various um, various rooms, if you will, outdoor rooms for activities, but in, in spots, so there might be a kid's, there's a kid's playground here that you can hardly see, but for kids, for just relaxing, for maybe for picnicking, uh, to enjoy some of the planning, some pathways, walking around, all these were consistent comments. And then one other thing I just wanted to, to point out again is that, that arrival experience, um, by the way, uh, we'll be providing bike paths along Willow Road uh, all the way up to the, to the tunnel on both sides, uh, Caltrans and uh, the city and, and uh, Meta were working to create um, standalone bike paths on either side of Willow Road. So very bike oriented. And, uh, but I just wanted to point this. So this, in terms of what I call that aha experience as you're coming up here and you make the turn, you saw the architecture I showed you before, which is the building, it's not quite on the, on the picture, um, and this one, and this park, and it, we hope that that conveys uh, a special residential place that blends relatively seamlessly with an office campus that um, you know will be seen, but seen as uh, with with uh, great architecture and uh, and integration with uh, a residential, vibrant, mixed use place. So that's the end of our presentation. Is there a way for me to exit this? <laughs> well, thank you very much for that. Uh, very thoughtful and, and thorough presentation. I'm sure we're gonna have questions from the commission. Uh, I think that the nature of our process is that uh, unfortunately we, we uh, have to focus on the things that people aren't satisfied with. Uh, but I would like to just commend you on you know, the outreach you've done to the community and the responsiveness to the community so far. Um, I want to ask uh, Mr. Parada, uh, typically now we would have clarifying questions from the commission. We would then go to public comment, and then we would return it to the commission for further questions and comment. I'm not sure what the protocol is for a presentation as opposed to a study session. Uh, is it appropriate to have public comment um, you know, on something that we're, we're not voting on tonight? So I'd just like to get your input on, on kind of the order to do things and what we should do here. Sure. So I uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to jump in and clarify and uh, provide some guidance here. Uh, first, it, public comment is at the chair's discretion. Um, it's certainly the chair, if is interested, can open it up to public comment. Um, and then in terms of the discussion, going back to my presentation, the, the discussion should be really focused on just clarifying questions. Commissioners shouldn't be taking this as an opportunity to provide comments or feedback, but really learning about the project. Um, if you take public comment, you would be learning, you know, the, the community's input and comment and interest in the project as well. And really all this should be considered as a learning opportunity to help inform the commission's future discussion as part of that, um, you know, public hearing process that we will take the project through. Uh, beginning with the draft EIR release and the, and the public hearing on the draft EIR and then a associated study session, which is really the more appropriate point for a, a detailed conversation on um, design, comments, uh, you know, questions about the project, stuff like that. Okay. Um, well, I will open up the public comment in just a minute because I think the public's input is important, of course. Um, I have one clarifying question that I would like to ask uh, Mr. Gilmetti uh, before we do that. Um, you mentioned a 30% reduction in office space and a resulting 30% reduction in office traffic. Um, but as I understand it, the, the number of square feet being developed is not being reduced. What's being taken out of office space is being put into uh, meeting rooms and, and conference rooms. Is that correct? Yeah, the office space uh, is reduced down to about 1.25 million square feet. There is up to another 350,000 square feet for uh, meeting uh, facilities and, and kind of collaboration space that 
the opportunity to be open for certainly Meta, but also uh, you know nonprofits and various organizations uh, in in uh, in Menlo Park. And so the thirty percent reduction in office traffic. I assume you know you don't have a traffic study yet. You haven't done any IR or anything, but. Um, it would be fair to assume that what's not happening with office traffic, there's going to be some substitution of traffic for the meeting space, especially I'm thinking if people are working from home and they're coming into Facebook once a, excuse me, meta once a week for meetings rather than every day for office work, uh, that there's going to be some substitution effect of people coming in for conferences and meetings as opposed to coming in at nine o'clock and leaving at five o'clock for an office job. Is that a fair assumption? Uh, you know, I think it's uh, the, the books to be written on, on how and when, uh, you know, office uh, use uh, occurs uh, both with Meta and I think with the region and, and, and the country for that matter. So I think what has been clear from Meta is a collaboration matters. Uh, and what we've heard from other employers, not speaking for Meta, uh, because we build other office spaces, is, is that a place for people to come in, whether it's five days a week or two days a week or somewhere in between, uh, is important for, for folks. And so I, I, that's one of the reasons this collaboration space is so important, uh, is it's, it's a place for people to be able to get together, in addition to the normal offices. Um, but I think the, to answer your, your question, I, you know, it's not just a reduction of, of the amount of office space, it's, it's a reduction in employee count. So from where uh, the, we were in 2019 to now, it's about a 30% reduction in headcount. Uh, so it is significant. Thank you. So um, I would like to try to stick with our general format. Uh, so if the commission has other clarifying questions, I'd like to uh, take them now, and then we'll go to... to um, public comment. So I see Commissioner Harris has her hand raised. Yes, hi. Uh, I think this is a question for staff. I'm just wondering when this project is going to be going to the Complete Streets Commission. So thank you. Uh, the, the project right now, it does not need complete streets commission review. And so it's it's not determined if it will in fact go to the complete streets commission. I can't make that statement right now. Hmm. When, when is that, when would we know that? And and how 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 is that determined? So it depends on a number of factors, and I, I would need to talk to our transportation team and get back to you on whether or not when complete streets are commissions required. Typically, though, for a project on private development on site, it doesn't require a complete streets commission. Okay, do we have other clarifying questions from the commission? All right, Mr. Pruder, I would like to open it up for public comment. Thank you, Doran. <laughs> At this time, uh, we have public comment underway, and I have two hands currently raised. Um, and just as a quick reminder for any members of the public, uh, a few more being added, to please raise your hand by pressing the hand icon on your Zoom interface or press star nine on your phone if you'd like to uh, join by phone for public comment. So we can begin. Uh, we have five hands at the moment raised for this item. So I, I will begin, sorry, Chair Dorn. Um, <laughs> the first of the commenters that I see on my list here is a person by the name of Corey Smith. I'm going to allow you to talk shortly, but first, just so you know, uh, you have three minutes to speak. And also if you could please state your jurisdiction along with your name uh, when you open your remarks, you should be able to speak now. Thank you very much. Good evening, Commissioners. Corey Smith on behalf of the Housing Action Coalition. We're a Bay Area nonprofit that advocates for more homes for residents at all income levels. And I am here to speak in strong support of the Willow Village proposal. I previously shared our letter of support along with a list of petition signers who have indicated their support for the proposal. After a detailed presentation, our project review committee determined that the project exceeds our high standards 
and will make a valuable contribution towards alleviating our regional affordability and displacement crisis. The project team has been communicating with neighbors for nearly four years now and has been very responsive to the community feedback. This has included prioritizing a grocery store that will be affordable for all residents, reserving retail space for local businesses, adding more affordable housing and senior housing, uh, which we are really big fans of, and decreasing the overall office space to create a more balanced uh, ratio of homes and office. We think that the team has also demonstrated continued community involvement by amending plans to achieve the best possible housing outcomes while also providing ample community open space. All in all, the Housing Action Coalition applauds the project team for striving to achieve the best possible project to meet the needs of the community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Pruder. You said we have several other hands. Yes, we do. Thank you, Chair Doran. Uh, thank you for your comment. Uh, Prior, we now have a person by the name of Justin Wang. Again, if you could please state your name and also your jurisdiction, I am now allowing you to speak. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair Dorn and other commissioners. My name is Justin Wang. I am a, I'm the advocacy manager at Greenbelt Alliance. I am a resident of Sunnyvale uh, in Santa Clara County, but here in my capacity as uh, at Greenbelt Alliance. So Greenbelt Alliance is an environmental nonprofit that encourages both the protection of open space as well as directing development and growth into our existing communities. We endorse developments in the Bay Area that help further these goals by providing an independent validation of smart infill housing, master plans, and mixed use projects. After careful review, Greenbelt Alliance is pleased to endorse the proposed Willow Village project. As a mixed use development, Willow Village would bring housing, jobs, neighborhood serving retail, and other community amenities, including a 4.1 acre public park, two acre elevated park, dog park, plazas, and 1.6 acre town square to a neighborhood without neighborhood serving retail and service uses. This 1,730 unit mixed use development has a solid commitment for affordability with 18% of the units across the project being offered at a below market rate rents with 100 units reserved for very, very low or for very low income seniors. Moreover, this project would reduce VMT, vehicle miles traveled, um, and bring these community amenities to an existing neighborhood without such amenities. The addition of such amenities to the area would reduce the number and length of automobile retail trips of existing wow. residents and employees. Willow Village is also located within a half mile of Facebook or Meta's <laughs> new major employment center with bike, pedestrian, and shuttle routes available so that employees do not have to drive. Similarly, the inclusion of retail in the project, again, causes the VMT from project residents and employees to be lower than it would be if the project did not include retail uses. With lead goal design, utilizing mass timber construction to greatly reduce the project's carbon footprint and all electric power, this is the kind of climate smart development that we need in the Bay Area to meet our housing goals, to meet our housing goals, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and make sure that every, that local residents are able to grow and thrive in their own communities as housing costs rise. Every city in the Bay Area must play their part to increase the housing stock to make sure the local workforce can afford to live close to jobs, schools, and services. And in doing so, further improving the social fabric of our communities and reducing the climate damaging greenhouse gas emissions produced by driving. I urge the, community, the, the commission to keep the ongoing climate crisis in mind and housing crisis as they consider this and future projects. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Pruder, if you could uh, just keep moving to the next uh, speaker as we go. Sure thing. Uh, I will do that following the next uh, speaker's finish. Um, the next commenter we have is someone by the name of Ken Chan, now allowing you to talk, but please uh, state your name and jurisdiction at the beginning of your comments. Thank you. Uh, hello, members of the Mendel Park uh, Planning Commission. My name is Ken Chan. I live in Hayward, but I'm here as an organizer. Uh, on behalf of the Housing Leadership Council of San Mateo County, uh, we work with our communities and their leaders to produce and preserve quality, affordable homes. Um, on behalf of the HLC, I'd first like to say that we appreciate the, uh, this proposal's approach to office development, where it allows up to 1,730 homes with 300 slated to be affordable that are desperately needed uh, by our community members here in Menlo Park. 
Um, when we talk about building offices, we should be requiring our developers include homes in their proposals. Little Village is a very good step uh, in this uh, direction. Thank you so much. All right, and the next commenter we have is someone by the name of Bonnie. Bonnie, I'm going to allow you to speak, and if you could please provide your name and your jurisdiction at the beginning of your comments. Uh, you can now speak at this time. Hi, uh, good evening, commissioners. Uh, my name is Bonnie Lamb. I live in the Bellhaven neighborhood down at 421 Hamilton Avenue. I've lived here for about five years already, and I want to uh, voice my strong support for Willow Village. Uh, I've been here basically right when they started doing the community outreach and I've attended the majority of the meetings and what I've seen, the changes that they're willing to um, to consider and as like as for the updated um, plans, they really took our community um, ideas, our community um, feedback into large considerations. I'm really excited about the retail space and I'm really excited about the parks uh, crossing right now, crossing like uh, Willow Avenue on Hamilton could be a little nerve wracking just because of all the cars. And I really appreciate the underpass and overpass as well as the beautiful parks that we're going to have. Uh, thank you guys for your consideration. I urge you guys to, um, when it comes up for vote, to approve it as soon as possible so we could get a move on. It's been, all right, thank you. Thank you very much. The next commenter is someone by the name of Fran Dean. Fran, I'm going to allow you to talk. If you could please uh, state your name and your jurisdiction at the beginning of your comment. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. And good evening, Commissioners. Fran Dean, Mental Park Chamber of Commerce. And I do want to thank you for the opportunity to comment this evening in support of the Willow Village Master Plan. The Chamber views the Willow Village project as a model of corporate campus expansion. The developers have truly listened to the community and delivered in response to that input. The team has engaged Menlo Park in an open community process for over four years. Public outreach has been unprecedented and they've made several substantive project modifications as a direct result, including moving the grocery store and other services to the first phase of construction, reducing the office footprint and increasing the amount of housing, in particular affordable housing. Willow Village also provides parks, trails, and open space for the community, retail spaces for local businesses to proliferate and to reiterate much needed housing. The project would not look like it does today without the Willow Village team listening to and integrating the community's feedback into this project design. Meta is and always has been a receptive, responsive neighbor in Menlo Park. They've invested tens of millions into the community, such as the new Bellhaven Community Campus, support for Menlo Park small businesses, local food subsidy programs, direct financial support of Menlo Park community organizations, and most recently, COVID-19 clinics for the Bellhaven residents. Meta is a model of corporate neighbor responsiveness. In summary, Willow Village should be viewed as a standard for community-based planning, delivering unprecedented community amenities and benefits to the neighborhood and to the city as a whole, while meeting Meta's long-term goal to remain, contribute, and flourish in Menlo Park. After four years, it's time for the project to move forward. When it formally comes before the Planning Commission for consideration, the Chamber of Commerce recommends support for Willow Village. Thanks very much for the ability to weigh in on this fabulous plan. Thank you for that comment. Our next commenter is a person by the name of Vince, Vince Rocha. Vince, I'm going to allow you to speak. And if you could please state your name and jurisdiction at the beginning of your comment as well, that'd be great. Thank you very much. Good evening, my name is Vince Rocha. I'm the Vice President of Housing and Community Development with the Silicon Valley Leadership Group. The Leadership Group was founded in 1978 by David Packard, co-founder of Hewlett Packard to tackle the issues of housing, energy, and environment for our community. Willow Village addresses all these issues and more. They've worked with the community to create 
affordable housing, open space, retail, and commercial development that is responsible for the community. We fully support this development and appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next commenter is a person by the name of Adrian Brandt. If you could please state your name and jurisdiction as well. I'm going to allow you to speak at this time. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Adrian Brandt. Uh, I am a member of the Caltrain Citizens Advisory Committee. Uh, that's for identification purposes. I'm speaking on my, my own behalf. I'm a, a Willows native, Menlo Park native, but live in Redwood City currently. Um, I'd like to comment on uh, an unfortunate situation where Facebook uh, was leading an effort to study the reactivation of the Dumbarton Rail Corridor upon which this project sits. And uh, they funded a, to the tune of over a million dollars, I believe, a, a feasibility study and then uh, an alternatives analysis study followed that. And when COVID hit, um, their their willingness um, to their publicly stated willingness to support even some of the capital costs of reactivating the Dumbarton Rail Corridor uh, seems to have evaporated, um, and it, it, I, I think it's uh, it's really sad because the the Caltrain I'm sorry the the Dumbarton Corridor has been owned um, by Samtran since about the early 1990s, and uh, they bought it for a song about six to eight million dollars as I recall and it's been sitting and growing weeds and this is you know we've had a lot of um, people commenting uh, and I agree it's a, it's a great development but commenting about reducing car trips and BMT and greenhouse and gases and such and, and um, providing relief on the on the very congested corridors leading to and from uh, Dumbarton Bridge and so I would really urge uh, the team to um, do all that it can to uh, encourage uh, now Meta, formerly Facebook, to um, re-examine its support and um, consider at least maybe looking at a, a scaled back implementation where uh, we could have uh, some, some rail service or transportation service on that corridor, at least uh, linking the Caltrain in Redwood City. It's a straight shot into Redwood Junction and uh, across the Bay, uh, the project was to link with BART, uh, Altamont Commuter Express, which, which is expanding into the Valley further and will connect with uh, the beginning of the High Speed Rail Authority system that is uh, in the Central Valley. And uh, obviously BART and uh, the Capital Corridor. So there's a, there's a huge opportunity here for um, trip reductions and getting people out of the cars and so forth and off of our very, very congested roads, uh, Willow Road, University, et cetera. So I would like to see the team talk more about and think more about um, using that corridor. The other very popular thing with the community and all the community hearings that occurred was a bike ped path for which there is also room on the corridor. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have one, what appears to be one final commenter at the moment. Uh, this person's name is Karen Eshu. Um, you'll be given a chance to speak now. And if you could please state your name and jurisdiction as well at the beginning of your comment. I see another commenter after that, actually. I apologize, two commenters currently. Hi, I'm Karen Eshu. I am the head of school at Mid Peninsula High School. Thanks for giving me the chance to speak on behalf of Mid Penn. Mid Penn is a next door neighbor to Meta and the proposed um, open space park um, is, right, uh, is right on the lot line that we share with the company. Um, we've, been, we've been really happy to partner with the folks who have been leading this development project and we think it's a great project. Um, we also are, um, are in conversation right now um, with folks who are leading the development, um, specifically with Eric Morley, um, to discuss the fact that we're hoping to add a few classrooms to our campus in the, um, in the next couple of years and would love to also improve our current space by adding some windows on one side of the building and looking to see how we might work together given the, the fact that there's gonna be open space on the other side of us um, that hopefully will help to make that happen. 
Um, we're looking forward to more conversations even later this week with Eric um, and anybody else from the project who might join us. But uh, we, we think it's a beautiful project. Um, I'm, you know, I grew up in the area as well. I'm so excited to see what's happening for Bellhaven in particular. This is an area of Menlo Park that deserves this. And we appreciate very much the fact that um, that Meta is putting so much into the area and really investing in it. And we're happy to be a part of that and looking forward to more conversations. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have one additional commenter. This may be the last currently I see as the last uh, by the name of Pam Jones. If you could please provide your name and jurisdiction at the beginning of your comment, you are now uh, capable of speaking at this time. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Pamela Jones. Um, I'm a resident of the Bellhaven community since 1974. Um, I have spoken out and written letters um, about, in, about this project. I think as a standalone project, it's fantastic. But what we still are not talking about is the fact that pre-pandemic, um, Facebook had approximately 16,000 employees in their buildings. Um, this project is going to add somewhere around uh, uh, 6,000 additional. Um, it's no secret that Facebook had planned on having approximately 35,000 employees. So unless we look at everything as a whole, um, the traffic nightmare that we currently have on Hamilton is due to increase. Um, we're not going to be in the pandemic for, forever. So at some time, everyone will be returning to the office. Um, with that being said, no, I cannot argue how much um, uh, the uh, signature group um, how many compromises they made how, and how much they worked with all of us. They did increase the number of apartments um, and they did reduce the office space. Um, I still say it could have been more, um, just like it could be more um, below market, which uh, in the fa past four years since the project began, um, that, that has changed significantly as we look at the, um, uh, the homeless population. Um, the other piece is, and, and I'm sure this will come up uh, later on, is that the um, that overpass kind of thing that's a parklet or something, uh, uh, there needs to be some very serious considerations with that, uh, particularly around its safety. Um, I do see that as a part of the project and not an amenity that would benefit um, uh, Bellhaven or any other place in Menlo Park. Um, lastly, I need to keep in mind what's going to happen to uh, the corner of Willow and um, uh, Hamilton Avenue, which is home of Jack in the Box and uh, five other restaurants and, and a nail place and, and, and um, uh, Starbucks. So it's not a retail shopping center, but at least it was some place where we could walk and it was small enough that we uh, knew everybody that worked there and it was very pleasurable. So I don't want to see um, that corner, you know, totally disappear. And the gas station needs to be somewhere that it's convenient for residents. Um, and, and I don't know how you're going to work that out, but I'm certain that you will. Um, again, thank you for the time to speak and also for the amount of time that you have given us to, uh, to let you know how we felt about things. Thank you for your comment. And uh, with that, Chair Doran, uh, I see no other hands raised or people requesting to comment. So if you'd like, you may close the public comment period. Yes, so I'm going to close public comment now. Um, bearing in mind uh, Mr. Parada's admonitions that we will have additional uh, opportunities to comment on this project when it comes before the commission, I would like to see if any commissioners have any further questions or comments that they want to make uh, on the project at this time. Mr. Riggs. Yes, thank you. I don't want to Miss the opportunity to add my thanks to Meta and to the design team um, for their obvious responsiveness since uh, we discussed this project more than two years ago. Um, I'm particularly impressed with the effort that 
must have gone in to realign Hamilton Avenue. Um, and overall, <clears throat> having, having been through um, a couple of planning projects, um, I know of the challenges and I know in a sense, it can always be just a little bit better. Uh, I think um, the design group here has really achieved something admirable. Um, uh, add in the sustainability that's particularly in the office construction proposal, uh, which, is, which has been a method that is, has been available for some time, but uh, is not re uh, readily accepted by developers. Um, again, that's very impressive. Um, and um, <clears throat> I'll just make a, a, a small personal uh, thanks for the significant lawn space that's indicated on the proposed park. Um, as we in our individual homes and of course uh, in multifamily housing give up lawn space, uh, we have to go find it somewhere or frankly, we cannot play. Um, I will note that um, there uh, are a couple of tests uh, that the project will um, will find itself in upon completion. One is that wide sidewalks are a philosophical wonderful so philosophically a wonderful thing, but as San Francisco has discovered, uh, wide sidewalks on parts of Market Street that simply do not have the activity result in frankly abandoned sidewalks and abandoned sidewalks are not well used and are not a pretty thing. So sidewalks have to vary in their width according to their population. Narrow sidewalks are not always a bad thing. Uh, among the most popular sidewalks in the world um, are in old cities where the sidewalks in some cases are less than three feet. And when you look at Polk Gulch or Knob Hill, you will see um, how lovely it is um, in certain instances to have the sidewalks appropriate to the use. But the bigger test that I did want to comment on um, uh, Mr. Adrian Brandt uh, spoke to um, much better than I could, which is that when this project is realized, it will be admired for its planning, its architecture, and I hope for a mix of uh, little retail spots. Uh, uh, Santana Row is a good example with some, I swear they're 20 foot wide retail spots as if you were in old Europe very successful and by the way, uh, successfully uh, financially. Um, but there will also be an overriding question of what happens to traffic. We already know what the arrival of our wonderful neighbor then known as Facebook did to traffic on the Bayshore Expressway uh, and to Willow Road and to an entire side of um, not only Bellhaven, but also the Willows and other neighborhoods that depend on um, connections to 101 or even just simple adjacency to 101. Hamilton Avenue will not be, uh, as mentioned by Ms. Jones, will not be the only street that is highly impacted by another 6,000 office workers, not to mention another well, um, maybe 3,000 residents. Traffic is going to be a huge issue when this building is complete. And the idea that as one of our out of town speakers cheerfully noted that there will be bicycles and shuttles, this isn't gonna get anyone to Hayward. In fact, this isn't even gonna get anyone to Redwood City. There are too many places that people have to go, but most importantly, the housing and the affordability are on the East Bay. The second best affordability for us, for our area is in Redwood City. And coincidentally, we do indeed have a rail line that goes from Redwood City connecting to Caltrain, right through Meta and out to Hayward and 
Union City and so forth. Um, this, there is an opportunity there, as Mr. Brandt put it so well, it's a huge opportunity. And our friends and neighbors at Facebook have advanced the option um, most generously by providing funds for initial programming. I don't want to join the many people who want to reach into Meta's pockets, but I do want to ask that Meta and their team use all their influence possible. Right now, I'm told by their respective offices that our two federal representatives strongly favor federal funds for the Dunbarton Rail system. I know that our county and many transportation executives with the county and the, and the transportation agencies strongly favor this effort. We do need all help we can get to press this forward. And I think Willow Village will, like it or not, be hugely defined by traffic. I hope we all end up working together on this goal. So that's my very partisan pitch and thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have other commissioners that would like to speak? Yes, I just would like to um, just say that sort of in response to something that was just said, um, I would really request that when we, when we um, infer how wide sidewalks will be used, that we just try to um, not impose any sub, you know, be not, not, we try to be objective about those spaces. The inference that one would make, um, you know, can be heard about thinking that, oh, homeless folks are going to be camping on those extra wide streets. And, you know, actually, I think what has borne out during COVID is that those extra wide sidewalks have been really great for extra seating where needed. So I just think that we should be really cautious in sort of what can be inferred from what we're saying about um, public spaces. That's all. Thank you. We have other commissioners. Commissioner Barnes. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you to the applicant for walking us through that. Uh, that was much appreciated. Um, and doubling back on the next phase of this project as you progress into the EIR, uh, I will say that it's been largely unsuccessful up to this point really getting a picture around traffic and traffic flows. And sometimes that's, you know, the scale of the development doesn't warrant in EIR, uh, you know, wide enough or with a, with a scope of outreach to be able to really delineate the following. I think there's, there's assumptions about traffic generation for this project. And I think that the community is well served to be looking at data uh, as best we can to understand current flows, where those flows originate from, and what role this may uh, play to what extent. Is it large? Is it small? Is it nominal? Is it, um, you know, is it material as far as the quote trips or traffic associated with this project. It would be a wonderful opportunity to really be dealing in data as opposed to um, assumptions about conditions and impacts and assumptions around impacts. So I'm, um, I'm gonna hope that when uh, this comes back around and as part of the process, there's the EIR, which is kind of hard to dig into and kind of figure out uh, not from an isolated standpoint, but in the context of the overall flow that's going through this corridor, what specifically is this project's um, additive amount to that and in which way and in what fashion and what in what way? And it, it's a little bit more complex in terms of ODs and so forth. But let's let's understand that so we can 
uh, have a real fact-filled discussion um, about you know what is or is not happening as a result uh, of this project because um, these discussions can go on. So thank you. I want to thank the um, applicant and look forward to seeing your project. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, anybody else on the commission wish to speak at this time? Um, I do want to add, oh, Commissioner Harris, go ahead. Yeah, I too would like to thank um, uh, Mike um, and um, the Tom and, and the group um, for providing us this presentation. Appreciate um, getting it back on our radars and allowing the public to weigh in. Thank you, Chair Dorn, for that. Um, I would like to echo some of what's been said by the other commissioners. Um, I'm very concerned, of course. I know I hear all the time from members of the community their concerns over traffic. Um, and I'm also concerned about the safety um, crossing Hamilton. I know that we're talking about how this is gonna be a community, pl the place where the community can also come, the Bellhaven community, but if they can't get there safely without going way out of their way to go up and over and down, I just, it that concerns me. So I just wanna echo what some of the other folks have said. And I really appreciate the comments from Adrian Brandt, who's talking about bringing back the, um, the Dumbarton rail. I think that's really an important uh, aspect. And I, I, I agree with Commissioner Riggs on hope that you guys can relook at that. Thanks. Thank you. Not seeing any other hands from the commission. I, I just want to add my own comments uh, that I want to agree very much with part of what uh, Commissioner Riggs said and Commissioner Harris. Um, you know, traffic is for many people in our community the, the biggest uh, impediment to supporting this project. And I know we're at an early stage, there will be traffic studies, there will be an EIR, we will see this application again. But if there's one issue uh, that I think stands out for the community is traffic. And unquestionably, despite uh, best efforts with shuttles and bicycles, et cetera, uh, this project's gonna add a lot of traffic. Uh, and the one, uh, you know, glaringly obvious opportunity to do something about that is a rail line that runs from Redwood City to the East Bay right through the middle of Meadows campus. Uh, so um, I would just uh, like to encourage the applicant to, to keep that in mind and, and to keep in mind that, um, you know, the, the most likely opposition to this project from the community is going to be to more traffic. And, you know, Dunbarton Rail is something that could really change that, uh, that dynamic and that outlook. Um, do we have any other commissioners that want to speak before we move on? Commissioner Tate. Um, <clears throat> yes, I, um, I really um, am excited that more housing has been uh, added, more BMR housing, because I, I think that um, not long ago I had heard that it was um, just going to be the senior housing. So I'm glad that there will be additional BMR uh, units. Um, and of course, traffic and the safety is an issue. Um, and I I guess the Dumbarton Rail is, is very interesting. Um, and also having access to Bayfront from inside of the property, like, you know, from the newly created area, that would probably relieve some of the traffic on Willow Road and, and would be welcome. So I don't know if that's something um, that is going to move forward uh, uh, with this project or not. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else from the commission? Okay. Well, I'm gonna thank the applicant once again for their time tonight. That was very helpful, this presentation. Uh, I want to close this item uh, F1, move on to uh, item G on our agenda, regular business. Uh, item G1 is the termination of substantial conformance at 709 Howard Avenue. This is a review of staff determination of exterior, exterior material changes to siding, windows, and doors at the main house and detached garage. And window and door relocations are in substantial conformance with the previous approval. So this is a project that's already been approved by the commission. 
Uh, there were some changes made to it. There was a staff memo determining that the changes were in substantial uh, conformance with the prior approval. And uh, that substantial conformance was, uh, was questioned by uh, one of the commissions. So I think that probably the most appropriate thing at this time is uh, to hear from that commissioner uh, on, on why he thinks that uh, it's not in substantial conformance and uh, you know, what could be done to bring it into conformance. Commissioner Doran, I am recused from this, but I'm just going to lower my volume so I don't hear you and I will be back on for the next the next project. Okay, thank you. Through the chair, could I um, add something? I believe that sure. I believe um, a teen who's the project manager has an update and I believe the applicant has a short presentation. Um, okay. And then just, just as a reminder to the commission, um, no conditions can be added um, in the review of the memo. The commission will just vote um, whether they agree with staff's determination of substantial conformance or disagree. And can you just clarify if the commission finds that it's not substantial conformance, uh, what path the application takes from there? Yeah, if the, uh, if the commission finds it's not in conformance, um, the applicant would have to bring uh, bring the structure into conformance would be one option, or the applicant's second option would be to file um, for use permit revision, which would go to the planning commission. And at that time, if the commission wishes to approve the project, um, conditions could be added. Okay, thank you. Um, I think I'd like to hear from Ms. Khan first and then from the applicant. Uh, good afternoon, Chair and the Planning Commission. Uh, just as an update to the memo, the applicant has noted that the windows will be simulated divided light with spacer bars. Uh, the applicant uh, would like to make a short presentation to the commission. So I will now hand off uh, and have them start off their presentation in regards to the windows and doors and the gridding. Thank you. And um, I'm here if there's any questions. And so is the uh, owners of the property and their architect. Thank you. Hi there. I'm Patrick Williams. This is my wife, Lori Lyons Williams. We're the owners at 709 Harvard. We understand there's a question about the grills on the windows. If we can navigate to the next slide, we'll give you the full update. This is a picture of the home as it appears now. We began our remodel, uh, beginning with the um, deconstruction really about a year ago, or I'm sorry, two years ago. It was January of 2020. As part of our demo, what we found was that there was extensive water damage and termite damage throughout the home in making, uh, in finding that we had to remove about 70% of the lumber, that's a final number. Uh, we moved beyond the original scope of work on our permit, which brought us in contact with the planning department. Working with Lionel Tapia, or Leo Tapia rather, we, um, we revised plans and submitted plans, got approval to move forward in June or July of 20. As part of that process, we shared with him our window plan. I show here what the screen grab from Pella shows. We use uh, Pella Architect Series traditional wood casement windows as part of our planning process to, be make, to make sure we made no mistakes in what we were ordering or being in full transparency with the city. We actually shared the Pella quote with all details on all specs on every single window in this home. The windows were ordered on the 26th of March in 2020. Now, because we were going through the resubmittal of plans and there were several versions that we worked through with Leo, there is an oversight that the rendering of our plan, despite showing everything that we were doing in terms of windows, the renderings on the back side of the house did not show the grills. If we can move forward one slide, you'll get a picture of what these windows look like. So we have a standard grill that comes with the Pella Architect series, it's a cross. Um, note that our windows are white in the exterior. All our windows show this cross except for two privacy windows that are in bathrooms. 
Again, this was on the original, the original quote, which was shared with Leo and the planning commissions, commissioners. The, the issue was we did not show it in the rendering on the back side of the house. That was an, an oversight on ours. And in candor, in Leo's, as we are working through multiple versions of our plans. If we can go through one more slide, you'll see details about these windows. Uh, we have a seven eighths of an inch OG. Again, this is standard on the Pella architecture series. And our understanding, um, this is not any expertise that I have in terms of these products. This is coming again from the Pella website, but they use a technology called Inte Integral Light Technology. The grills are a permanent part of the window. They're bonded to the inside and outside of the window glass. Foam spacers are in between the grills to cast a realistic shadow. All windows in this house prior to our renovation uh, were single pane windows. In fact, some were from the original construction in 1938. So removing and replacing the windows, upgrading the windows was a big part of this project. If we go ahead one more slide, you can see what the home looks like. Front is the, the left picture shows the front of the home. The right picture shows the rear of the home. You can clearly see the windows and then also the grills on those windows and, um, and French doors. If we move ahead one more slide in addition, you'll see uh, the right or the left side of the home. That one's a, a bit tougher to see. That's where our uh, storage for uh, garbage cans, things like that are. But again, you can see the windows, you can see the grills. The right picture shows the right side of the home that is adjacent to the driveway. So as we, as we look at this project now two years on, all construction has finished. We approached Leo, uh, I believe it was June, July to do our final, to get final sign off from the planning department so we can move forward with our final inspections. His, uh, his leaving the department left the handoff to Fatin. We've worked with Fatin, but as we look at this project, we have worked fully in good faith with the city to be fully transparent in what we're trying to do with the home. The windows that we've installed have never changed relative to what we communicated in March of 2020 to Leo and ultimately the planning department. Uh, the one issue is inversion control as we were going through different changes on our plan uh, with Leo that it wasn't reflected on the rent on the rendering that was ultimately approved. So at this point, I want to turn it over for any questions or areas that we might clarify. Do we have any clarifying questions from the commission? Commissioner Riggs. I can't say it's really a clarifying question since um, the issue that was presented in the um, memorandum regarding substantial conformance has been corrected by the applicant. Um, the windows are what the city always asks for, which is simulated to true divided light. Um, I'm the one that uh, questioned why they weren't simulated true divided light um, and whether or not the applicant would like to clarify that. I have to share that I was told the applicant was not allowed to modify uh, the application and it either had to come here or, or not. Um, so I'm sorry that the process was required, <laughs> but the clarification is there. And I think we can, uh, well, I'll, I'll take the opportunity to move uh, to find that the Project at 709 Harvard Avenue is in substantial conformance. We have a second. Commissioner Harris has got her hand raised. Uh, I'm going to move to a vote. Commissioner Barnes. Yes. Commissioner Ducardi, are you back? Yes, and I've been here for the whole time for this, and I vote yes. Thank you. Commissioner Harris. Yes. Mr. Kennedy. Recused. Oh, right. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Riggs. Yes. Commissioner Tate. Yes. I'll vote in favor as well. So we have six in favor with one commissioner recused. 
Uh, thank you very much for your appearance tonight. Sorry to put you through this, but uh, go forth and enjoy your windows. <laughs> thank you. Nice looking home, by the way. Thank you. Appreciate it. We're very happy. Thank you. Okay, um, I'll now open the public hearing portion of tonight's meeting. Uh, item H1 is a use permit uh, by Charlene Chung at 269 Willow Road. This is a request for a use permit to construct a new two-story residence with an attached garage on a substandard lot with regard to minimum lot depth in the R1U single family urban residential district. The parcel is a vacant panhandle lot with access via an easement located over 267 and 275 Willow Road. And 269 Willow Road is proposed as the new address for the subject parcel. We do have a staff report on this uh, by Mr. Paz. Um, Mr. Paz, do you have anything to add to the staff report or any corrections or anything? I have a few updates. Thank you, Chair Doran and members of the commission. We were informed at the uh, prior to the meeting uh, that Commissioner Barnes uh, would um, be accusing himself. So I wanted to confirm uh, that and then also uh, make it known for the for the minutes. And I see uh, Commissioner Barnes's camera has um, has gone off. So thank you for that. The other items I wanted to to raise were items of correspondence that were received after the publishing of the staff report. One was added to the agenda ahead of this meeting, and uh, that was uh, from a neighbor um, resolving some of the, the correspondence that uh, had occurred back and forth with the, the project team. And that was included as part of their project description letter. So uh, you may have seen that in advance of, of this meeting. There was also an, another um, item of correspondence that was received before the meeting. Uh, noting some concerns over uh, proposed change to the fences between the subject property and the property to its left at, uh, I believe, 247 Willow Road. And, and that is uh, available as well. Finally, wanted to address one of the, the comments that, that was received regarding the Arbrish report and an inconsistency noted by a neighbor in that report staff was able to confirm that the, the tree numbers shown in the tree inventory and the tables shown on the plans uh, were shown consistently. However, there, there were labels on the photos within the Arbors report uh, that did not reflect the, the accurate numbers in the table. And so it's staff's recommendation that a project specific condition be applied uh, such that simultaneous with the submittal of a complete building permit application, the applicant would be required to provide an updated Arbor's report that corrects those photo labels for the trees uh, to be shown consistent with the tree inventory table and the project plans subject to review and approval by staff, um, specifically the planning division and city arborist. And uh, that's it for the, the updates at this time. We do have members of the project team uh, here who have prepared a, a brief presentation um, after uh, clarifying questions for staff or, or prior at the discretion of the chair. Yeah, I would like to see if the commission's got any clarifying questions for Mr. Paz at this time. I have one. Uh, yeah, uh, Commissioner Ricard. So it's uh, non-conforming because of lot depth, is that correct? That is correct. If it, if you just if an attachment C if we just switch the width and the depth wouldn't it be conforming, and isn't this a unique parcel? Like how, how does how does that get determined? And I'm unclear why this is coming to us. So it has to do with the the point at which the the handle of the pan reaches the pan, so to speak. So the access to the to the lot where the the access from the right of way reaches the property, that's the front of the lot. And so if you see sometimes where it will come at a corner and then the shorter of the two lots that front the access is the front where the access only reaches one property line, then the property line that it reaches becomes the front property line. And in this case, the front property 
uh, the distance between the front property line and the rear property line, the lot depth is less than the, the minimum required and, and thus the, the lot is substandard with respect to lot depth. Terrific, thanks for the clarification. Do we have any other clarifying questions from the commission? Okay, we have someone from the applicant to make a presentation, Mr. Boss. That is correct. And I will be, uh, I will be um, driving the presentation. So, so bear with me and then I believe. Um... Yes. Henry. Okay, great, yeah. thanks. Yeah, my name is Henry Jane. I'm the architect of the project. Um, thank you so much for um, giving me the opportunity to present the project. And I really, really appreciate your comments and advices. And also I would like to say, I would like to thank my team, which is the owner and um, landscape architect, Brad, and also um, Arborist. And my structure engineer, civil engineer, they, um, they put a lot of effort on this project. I appreciate all their help. Uh, now I can um, quickly present this project. And um, thank you, uh, Planner um, Path. Um, appreciate your help in past uh, um, months. Uh, and also I appreciate your very, very detailed report actually. Uh, so I don't have to waste a lot of time, everybody's time uh, to uh, talk about a lot of technical details. And um, this is the first page, which is the first impression of the project. Yeah, second page, please. And this page actually is just uh, um, the, uh, what covered in this presentation. Thank you. Next one. And this is the uh, puzzle map. So as you can see, uh, the below road is in the bottom of the page. And the property actually is um, behind the two other properties actually with a um, easement uh, through uh, these two properties. So um, it's quite unique, or I can say special. Um, yeah, that's the, re the width of the, um, the lot is quite wide and well, the depth of the lot is um, quite, um, quite minimized. It's um, 70 is supposed standard, uh, uh, planner, uh, pass, please correct me if I'm wrong. And we are a little bit shy on that. Next page, please. Yeah, next page, please. Yeah, uh, these pictures um, have been taken about one week ago, actually uh, last Sunday. So it's quite recent, uh, recently. Uh, the, the top one basically is I swing my camera off from the all the way from the left all the way to the uh, right. But it's a little bit uh, misleading because um, you see uh, all four sides of the property at the same picture, uh, which should help us to understand the uh, site. Um, I purposely put two uh, red lines uh, um, in the picture, which is indicate the two corners of backside of the property. Yeah, and uh, of course, another two um, uh, pictures shows the one uh, actually the lower uh, bottom, uh, lower uh, um, left hand side is a B, which is shows the uh, left side of the property, and then the C, which is shows still the left hand, but actually a little bit of back of the um, property. Yeah, and as you can tell, um, it's a empty lot, it's a vacant lot for like, I don't know how many years. Uh, it's almost like abandoned site. And, um, but it's very, very nice neighborhood. Okay, yeah, next page, please. And this is uh, the aerial um, map that shows the all adjacent properties. And again, a um, little bit of special um, situation and a little bit of challenge for the design because uh, the depths um, constraints of the site. Uh, you know, um, give 20 feet of the real yard setback plus uh, 20 feet of front yard setback. We don't really um, have much um, space to play around. 
and especially the garage, you have to um, feed from the front yard and um, 20 feet is the minimum plus the wall thickness and then the um, backup space, uh, 25 feet for the car. We don't really have much um, to move around. Um, yeah, but I, I probably it's very small to see. We have a dotted line to show the, where the second floor is. Uh, we did um, struggle a little bit and we did a really, really careful to place the second floor um, not too close to the um, uh, side yard um, setback and uh, um, further away from all the neighbors. Next page, please. And well, uh, this page probably further um, uh, indicate where the second floor is and what's the first floor is. And uh, of course, as a quite a standard, the first floor, um, the bottom side, we do have a one car garage. And then uh, we enter uh, to the family uh, room and of course it's connected to the uh, open kitchen. And then um, the right hand side is the staircase to go to the second floor. And well, um, uh, adjacent to the stairs um, up a little bit is the foyer and then um, go keep up, which is the northern side. You enter the uh, living room and the dining room. And while in your front yard side is your uh, a, uh, office with a um, small bathroom. And of course you go to uh, uh, up to stairs. You have uh, three bedrooms above. One is a um, master bedroom, which is in the northern side and the two small um, secondary uh, bedrooms over the bottom side. And the two um, um, bedrooms shares one bathroom. And of course the master will have a uh, walk-in closet and a uh, bathroom. Next one. And this is shows the front elevation and the, also the materials um, down below. Um, yeah, typically I'm not the huge fan of um, colonial style, um, but to be given this special lot, it, somehow it's fit quite well and um, it it's works out fine. And um, the, as you can tell, a um, couple of things. One is um, the typical window style. Uh, we try to um, meet the uh, colonial style. And of course, the second one, um, other than just to repeat the march that along, uh, sort of close to the uh, colonial style, and we uh, place the window sill uh, three feet, which is a squeeze window, kind of a minimize the size, um, almost to the you know push to the limit to give the egress um, you know uh, opening. And of course, all the windows in the front side, we, um, we will have shutters and also the grill, the grid in the, uh, in the, um, and the, uh, integrated in the window. And the next one, I believe is the backside and the side, uh, side elevation. The backside, we do have um, six small windows uh, on, the, um, on the backyard. And of course, the first floor, um, the style is slightly different. We wanted that as open as possible and provide much uh, nature lighting as much as possible. While the second uh, floor, the window, you can tell is much, much more smaller and plus with the grid integrated with the window. And also we, um, we um, broken the window to the smaller sizes, um, a consistent the all. Uh, second floor windows. And uh, you might notice we do not have um, any window in the uh, second floor uh, side uh, facade uh, because um, first of all, the side, uh, side setback is only 10 foot while the rear and the front is 20. So the side yard setback is much, much smaller uh, than the rear um, and the front setback. So um, to respect the privacy of the neighborhood, we do not have any window of the um, side of facade. And also that amazingly that's uh, consistent with the style uh, quite well. 
And the first floor, the living room, which is the northern elevation, had only very uh, two small um, windows. Next page, please. And this is not in the um, plan set, but uh, this probably, yeah, but normally people won't see that angle, but um, it's just to tell the story of how we carefully uh, place the second floor uh, massing, and we step down the uh, northern side and the southern side to the first uh, of the only one floor. And um, I think I uh, uh, I spent too much time. Uh, I think the uh, real um, uh, planner uh, parts report actually tells a much much more story uh, than what I, what I can plan. Uh, I can prevent. And um, I would like to open the questions um, for everybody um, if I can answer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if we have clarifying questions for the applicant now, we can take those, but I want to move on to public comment before we uh, have real discussion from the commission. Does anyone have a clarifying question? Commissioner Riggs. I'm, I'm just curious, uh, because of the dormer windows, uh, is there attic space uh, that is either present or intended? Yeah, uh, thank you, um, Commissioner uh, Rick. Uh, thank you for your question. Yeah, um, I did not address that in my presentation. Yes, uh, the dormer, yes, it's it's uh, above the attic space, but one in the center dormer is provide the lights all the way to down below, which is the open to below space, all the way to the uh, foyer, that's the central light. The second one, which is over the uh, northern side, is provide the nature light for the um, uh, second floor uh, lounge room. And the uh, southern side, which is provide the, uh, for the uh, staircase. And you know, you might notice we do not have exterior window in the front uh, 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 along the staircase and the laundry room. Hopefully, that uh, answers your question, uh, Commissioner Risks. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not seeing any other clarifying questions, so uh, I would like to open it up for public comment at this time. Uh, Mr. Pruder, do we have any hands raised now? Thank you, Chair Doran. We do have two hands raised. And as a reminder, if anyone else would like to speak for this public comment for this item, uh, please press the hand icon on your interface. And you can also press star nine if you're dialing in. I will begin with the first commenter um, whose account appears to be J Spira or maybe J S Spira. I'm going to um, allow you to speak. And if you could please uh, provide your name and your jurisdiction. You'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you very much. You may speak now. Hello, my name is Josh Spira. Um, just wanted to make sure you all can hear me. Yes, we can. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, thank you to all the commissioners and the architects and everyone involved on the project. I live at 245 Willow, which is uh, with my wife and child, um, which is next to the proposed project at 269. And I had a question about the fence um, on the plan and in the diagram that the architect was just showing. It shows that the fence, um, which is currently a seven foot fence is gonna be brought down to a four foot fence um, towards the front of the new proposed property line at 269. And my understanding is that that is a, um, a city regulation but with that being said, uh, they're gonna, the, the plans are to take out our existing fence, which is uh, seven feet and uh, provides us with privacy uh, and replace part of that with a four foot section, which would be invasive to our privacy. Uh, I would hope that there would be a way to either keep the existing fence or have it be replaced with another seven foot fence, although the, the current fence is in good shape. Um, because of the unique nature of our property and how all of the properties interface with each other. Um, I, I did email uh, Ori earlier tonight and Ori, I appreciate you replying quickly to me. 
I'm not sure exactly what, what channels I would need to go through in order to try to get the four foot fence become seven so that uh, we can continue to enjoy the privacy on our lot, uh, as well as um, the new the new residents of 269 can can have that that little corner of privacy in their lot as well. So um, Ori or anyone else, if, if there's anything you could tell me that I would need to do to follow up on this, I would greatly appreciate it. And uh, thanks again, look forward to working with everyone. Thank you. And uh, I think we will try to address that uh, after public comments are finished. But now I want to move on to uh, the other speaker that has a public comment. Yes, thank you, Chair Dorn. We have a person by the name of Rick Schwartz. I'm going to allow you to speak at this time. Again, if you could please provide your name and jurisdiction, you have three minutes to speak starting now. Thank you, uh, Rick Schwartz here. Um, I, we live, uh, my wife and I, at 254 Santa Margarita. Uh, we've owned and lived in our home uh, that sits immediately to the rear of the property for over 35 years. I want to emphasize we're not opposed to developing the parcel, but in reviewing the plans, we noticed aspects of the design that we believe significantly degrade the aesthetics and privacy of our property. We're struck by the massiveness of the structure for such a small lot. I would note that we have a living unit, a cottage at the rear of our property about 20 feet from the property line. Inexplicably, this living unit isn't shown on the area plan, even though two other outbuildings that aren't living units on our property are shown. We're also struck by the lack of articulation in the rear wall of the structure. From our vantage point, we'll be facing a flat edifice about 48 feet long and 20 feet high, not counting the roof and not counting the additional one-story 15-foot wings on both sides. We'll have six second-story windows overlooking our property and looming over our cottage and portions of the proposed deck behind the structure will stretch to within three feet of our property line. Many trees will be removed. Only three small trees will remain in the 20 foot setback behind our property out of six that are currently in that setback area. And two of, two, two of the three that remain are on the sides rather than in front of the, between us and the rear of the house. In our comments, we requested consideration of four alterations. One, move the footprint four and a half feet closer to Willow Road, which adds four and a half feet to the minimal 20 foot setback at the rear of the property, which would increase privacy and allow for more plantings. Two, articulate the rear wall of the structure to reduce the massiveness. Three, reduce the number or impact of the second story windows at the rear. And four, increase the number of trees or other tall plants to provide year round screening between the proposed structure and our property line. Thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to address any questions. And I apologize for the late comments. Uh, we, when we received the initial application submittal, it was at a time we were distracted by a family emergency with the unexpected deaths of my sister and a brother-in-law. And the past year has been an extremely difficult one for my wife and me. So sorry for the late comments and appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Um, Mr. Pruder, do we have other public comments at this time? Thank you, Chair Doran. We do have one other commenter. Um, I can share them. Uh, share their comment at this time. This uh, person is named Samira Ozorgi. Um, you have three minutes to speak. If you could please state your name and your jurisdiction at the beginning, that would be great. And I will allow you to speak starting now. Hi, thank you all. Um, my name is Samira Bazorgi. I'm the owner at 245 Willow Road. I live here along with my husband, Josh Spira, who spoke earlier. Um, I'm interested in um, also following up about um, the council taking into account the unique nature of our property in that we, we don't have a backyard. Therefore, our side yard that we share with 269 is our backyard. Um, therefore, we have a vested interest in that seven foot fence remaining and not being reduced to four feet because it is our private space. It is our backyard. 
we have a three-year-old um, and we use that space uh, as a backyard because we live on Willow Road and therefore there isn't very many places for a young kid to play safely away from cars. So we want to make sure that everyone takes into consideration the very unique nature of our lot you can see its uniqueness among the other lots in the area. If you look um, on the map, uh, when you are um, looking at this plan, the other thing I am also interested in in learning if there is more screening, um, uh, the what the previous caller mentioned along our fence line um, to increase property uh, privacy as well. Um, I believe that's all the comments I have. Thank you for the time. Thank you. Do we have any other hands raised from the public? Right, so this time we do not chair Dorn. So if you'd like, you could close the public comment period. We've had quite a bit of time. Yeah, I think I will close public comment and bring it back to the commission. Um, I would like to, uh, I, I see your hand raised, uh, Mr. Zhang. I'll get to you in one second, but I wanna ask a clarifying question to Mr. Paz. Um, I wanna try to understand the fence issue uh, I thought I understood it until I looked at the plot map and I see 245 is on what we're calling the side of this lot. So uh, I thought that the issue would have been, you know, uh, the zoning regulations about the front yard fences, but that seems to be what we're defining as a side yard. So I'm not clear on why there's a problem with the seven foot or at least a, a fence taller than four feet on the side yard. Could you? Clarify that for us. Yes, and it, it comes back to the uh, the lot orientation question uh, that we um, talked a, a little bit about previously. So similar to the subject property 245 Willow Road is accessed um, at a at a T, so to speak. And so the the front of that lot is similarly um, uh, the property line that is is nearest to Willow Road. So they're, they're, both of the front property lines are parallel to Willow Road. And so then you, you take the front setback from the front property line and you apply it 20 feet in from there. And within that front setback, the fences, walls and hedges section of the zoning ordinance allows a four foot tall fence. Beyond the front setback, fences are allowed to be up to seven feet in height in residential areas. And through use permit, you can request uh, you can request a conditional use permit to allow a taller fence in that front setback area, uh, which which is an avenue available to either the the applicant or um, or the neighbor. However, that that request was not included in the proposal, and therefore was not included in the the words describing uh, this request and the notices that went out ahead of this meeting. And therefore, um, could not be an action taken by the commission tonight if it, if it were to take action on on that item. But you wouldn't be able to take action on that item, is what I'm trying to say. Because it wasn't on the agenda. Correct. Yes. Thank you. Um, well, I, I think I know the answer to this question, but I do want to ask Mr. Zung about the applicants. Uh, yeah feeling on the desirability of a higher fence on this uh, property line. Yeah, thank you for asking and I appreciate the comments. Uh, currently, as the photograph showed, it is a, a, a tall fence actually, which is provide the uh, privacy between uh, the neighbor and the, uh, our property, um, our project property. We don't really mind at all tall fence, definitely, but we try to, as an architect, we try to respect uh, city's code and the city's requirement. And a um, couple of things we can do. First of all, we agree to have a tall fence. We can, we can help our neighbor to uh, file the application or something uh, if we can get the city's approved to build a tall fence. Or we don't mind to keep the existing fence, which is we can just uh, keep that um, if city uh, agree with that's a either non-conforming or something uh, we can we can keep to provide the uh, privacy uh, between the neighbors. We don't mind either way. Thank that's, you. That's for answers to this question. And for um, I'm also I can I'm more than happy to answer 
uh, Mr. Um, uh, Schwarzer's question, which is the backyard. We never, um, we visited them um, according to the owner of the property. They visited the, um, uh, the backyard neighbor and more than six months ago, uh, they did not hear much about the comments. And uh, we received this email um, today. Uh, um, yeah, we feel, um, I mean, very sorry for uh, our neighbor. And we try our best to work with him to address all your concerns. Uh, um, and I appreciate your advice, which is we have five um, advices and I can try my best to answer one by one, or I can um, see, um, any um, acceptable solutions for uh, all of us. The first one, uh, move the footprint. Yes, we have a, maybe a little bit of room to move that. But um, we, as I uh, mentioned earlier, we do need a 20 feet minimum for the garage and 25 feet for the backup space for the car uh, turning radius. So really the footprint, we don't really have much to can be moved, um, especially the um, easement is from the front of the yard side and the, the car need to turn twice in order to get into the garage. Um, that's uh, answer the first question. The second question is uh, articulate uh, second floor and the first floor. Um, uh, yes, that's, that, it is a good suggestion. But to be given the very narrow, narrow site uh, of the site of constraints, um, we felt um, articulate a longer side, which is northern and the south side, um, to step down to the first floor um, is much, much more effective to the overall massing. While the second floor and the first floor articulation um, with the seven foot backyard fence, um, probably really barely can even see the nine foot um, eave line. Um, I mean, yeah, of course we can do that. It's probably not as effective as the current massing though. Uh, uh, then um, we, I'm, I'm, I'm here not able to speak for the landscape architect and um, uh, arborist, but uh, I did have a conversation with our landscape architect. We are more than happy to provide more uh, privacy trees. We are more than happy to uh, work with our neighbor um, to see what we can do to um, provide the maximum privacy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so on, on the first issue about the fence, it sounds like both property owners are in favor of keeping a tall fence and this tall fence there already uh, we may be prohibited from considering a use permit application to do that tonight, but if anyone on the uh, commission or the staff uh, has any ideas about how we could ensure that that happened or make it more likely that this actually, this use permit gets filed, um, I would certainly like to hear it. Um, do we have other commissioners who would like to speak on this application now? Okay, I'm not seeing any. Uh, Commissioner Riggs. Sorry, I couldn't find my uh, hand button because I had moved my screen down. Um, so first of all, um, I don't think I'll be the only commissioner to observe this, but <clears throat> for all intents and purposes, this is a conforming lot, <clears throat> a vacant conforming lot. And I think it's <clears throat> unfortunate that um, it had to come to commission, but one has sets of rules that apply 99% of the time, perhaps not quite that well. Um, and those exceptions do come here. <clears throat> um, I don't really have any objection to any elements of this project. Um, and um, I think it's well executed. Certainly if you're going to do a colonial um, home, um, you might as well do it right. And I have to say, this is, um, this is what I 
grew up seeing in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So um, I, I do uh, appreciate the uh, responsiveness regarding planting additional trees in what I'll call the lower right corner to assist the belated request from 254 uh, Santa Margarita. Um, <clears throat> and I hope that will become a condition of our approval tonight. Um, on a somewhat more difficult issue, <clears throat> I, as a, albeit volunteer, but a, a part of the city, I'm embarrassed, I mean, truly embarrassed when I hear that a requirement to have a four foot high fence maximum at the street facade of a residential lot is applied more than a hundred feet deep in um, a panhandle lot. Um, I, I just cringe at the thought of trying to defend that interpretation. Um, I have long understood that you can't have a seven foot fence within 20 feet of a public right of way, but to define it as the front facing edge of the lot rather than the right of way. Um, <clears throat> and this is not, it's not as if this is a recently applied um, code with a typo. Uh, I mean, we've had this code and we've revised our codes over a couple of decades. Um, I, I propose um, that, if I may be so bold, if staff would look at their option to interpret the code as meaning 20 feet from the right of way, if it does not literally say that, and I have not been able to look up chapter 16 quite quickly enough in order to actually see the wording. I'm in the meantime also embarrassed that <clears throat> although the applicant apparently knew of this code and did not ask at least for his neighbor's sake not to demolish an existing fence, which just in my humble opinion, um, this project has no right to do. Um, I'm embarrassed that the <clears throat> applicant was not coached to make uh, his application to include the request um, for use permit exception. So um, through the chair, I guess I would like to ask if staff could look at the interpretation of this requirement regarding the fence. Look again, I should say. Mr. Paws, would you like to respond to that? Certainly, and I'll, uh, I may defer to our uh, planning commission liaison as well. Um, however, the, the codified language is, is clear about the, the height of fences not exceeding four feet in the required front setback. And so we, we are bound by the existing um, code. I'm not sure, uh, Karina, if you have anything to add. I'm sorry, Ori, did you use the phrase front setback? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, um, through the chair, I just wanted to add that we have consistently, this has consistently been applied this way for panhandle lots. So um, it's not something staff has discretion on. Um, if the applicant would like to amend their agenda, or I'm sorry, amend their application, I think one way forward would be to continue the project and then re-notice it um, for a future meeting. Um, there may be room on February 14th. I think we'd have to look at that as a larger group, but um, 
I think the first step would be if that's something the commission is interested in is to ask the applicant if they would want to amend their application with the use permit request um, for the higher fence. Well, I, I would be interested to see what the applicant, uh, how the applicant feels about that. I don't want to delay their project, but uh, it does seem a waste to tear down an existing fence that uh, property owners on both sides would prefer to have preserved. Mr. Zhang, do you have a reaction yeah, um, definitely, on this? Definitely, we Just, can keep that. Um, we can keep the existing fence. We don't have to build any new, definitely. Yeah, yeah what, what's your feeling? Right now, so I did ask them. <laughs> I, I, haven't, um, I haven't heard from the rest of the commission, but what would your feeling be about uh, continuing the application uh, to allow you to amend it to add uh, a use permit request uh, to keep the existing fence? Um, Mr. Zhang, I, I don't know if you could, could hear me. That was a question for you. Yes, yes. I'm, uh, I was asking the owner, which is sitting in the same room. They totally agree with that suggestion. No problem. Thank okay. You. I think then what I'd like to do is continue uh, with this conversation, see if we have any other issues. Uh, since you're before us now, we've seen the plan. Uh, and then um, I might look for, uh, after we do that, I might look for a motion to continue this to the next available meeting with the understanding that uh, hopefully that will be the only thing uh, on the agenda for a future meeting. Um, do we have uh, other commissioners that would like to speak on this application now? Commissioner Harris. Yeah, I just, I, I feel like we've talked about this quite a bit and I'm just, I'm just a little disappointed that we would have to continue it. I'd like to let um, the owners um, move forward as soon as possible. So I guess if we are gonna continue it um, and require them to come back again, um, I would suggest that since this will be, I would imagine a very quick um, item, we could add it just to our next meeting agenda and not have to make them wait any further. Yeah, I'm certainly amenable to that. And I, I think we should be able to do it very quickly at the next meeting. Uh, Ms. Sandmeyer, do you have an opinion on that? Um, yeah, it may be possible. We would need to kind of confirm with the overall project load. I did want to clarify, we're not, this is not a requirement. The applicant, it could just ask the commission to go forward as the application is presented for a vote tonight. So it's their choice. It's not a requirement to continue it. Um, right. But I, I suppose if we approve the application, even with the understanding that, uh, that they'll file a use permit to keep the fence, we don't have any way of making sure that that happens. Is that correct? We can't condition the approval on keeping the existing fence unless we continue we continue it so the use permit can be noticed. Is that correct? Yes, so that yes, the existing fence is not in conformance. So it couldn't, you're right, it couldn't be conditioned to um, keep right. the fence. Well, that would, um, that would certainly be my preference because uh, I would like to, you know, have some certainty that uh, this would get done. Um, does anyone else on the commission want to speak this time. Does anyone want to make a motion to continue to the next available meeting? Commissioner Riggs. Yes, I would like to um, move that this be uh, continued to the next available meeting, um, uh, particularly noting um, Ms. Harris and the chair's comments that this would be a very brief review. Um, I, I would hope would not take up more time than it takes to read the item uh, and a quick vote. Um, although uh, if this is coming back, I think it would save us adding a condition if uh, a couple of privacy trees were also shown on the uh, revised site plan. Um, so uh, I, I still move uh, that we continue the project. For those Thank you. Items. Do we have a second? 
Okay, I think I will second the motion from the chair and move to a vote. Uh, Commissioner Barnes is recused. Commissioner DeCarty? Yes. Commissioner Harris? Yes. Commissioner Kennedy? Yes. Commissioner Riggs? Yes. Commissioner Tate? Yes. And I will vote in favor as well. Uh, so we have six votes in favor of continuing with one uh, recusal. Um, I will just note for the applicant's guidance, I, I don't find anything else uh, to object uh, on the application. So hopefully we can move this quickly at our very next meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, next item on our agenda is uh, environmental impact report scoping session. This is the sixth cycle housing element and safety element updates and environmental justice element of the city of Menlo Park general plan, city of Menlo Park. Preparation of an EIR for the six cycle housing element and safety element updates, and a new environmental justice element for the city's general plan, collectively referred herein as the housing element update project in compliance with requirements of the California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA. The EIR, EIR will be a subsequent EIR to the city's 2016 general plan EIR, state clearinghouse number 2015062054. The project analyzed in the EIR would include adoption of general plan amendments that would add or modify goals, objectives, policies, and implementation programs related to housing, safety, and environmental justice that would apply citywide. General plan amendments would also include conforming amendments to other elements of the general plan necessary to ensure internal consistency. Amendments to the El Camino Real and downtown specific plan and the zoning ordinance would also be necessary to modify development standards for certain zoning districts and the affording house, affordable housing overlay, H A H O district, to allow higher residential densities for the production of more housing. In addition, the housing element would identify specific sites appropriate for the development of multifamily housing, in particular affordable units, and the city would rezone those sites as necessary to meet the requirements of state law. The preliminary list of existing and proposed sites that can accommodate development of multifamily housing includes sites that are located across the city and is subject to refinement based on additional public input and review of the draft housing element by the Department of Housing and Community Development of the State of California. It is anticipated that the project would complete a full EIR and no topic areas would be scoped out with the exception of agricultural and forestry resources and mineral resources, which are topic areas that are not anticipated to require future, further analysis. Uh, we do have a uh, staff report by uh, Mr. Smith is with us tonight. Uh, do you have any uh, additions or corrections to the staff report? Good evening, Chair Doran and Commission members. Um, actually, I have a brief presentation that I would like to give um, to begin, but uh, while we're loading that, I would note that we received two items of correspondence today on the project, and those have been updated in, in the agenda packet. Um, one is from Misha Sillin, and it's uh, uh, going into details about concerns of the sites that will be included in the sixth cycle uh, housing element and whether those are feasible for development or if uh, we need to add more sites to the element out of concerns that uh, we may not actually develop the amount of housing that is anticipated from the modifications that are proposed. And the other item is from Jacqueline Winder and she provided some comments uh, appreciating the inclusion of transportation and climate change in to be studied in the EIR. Um, and then uh, wanted more clarification on impacts to school districts and individual schools um, and, and uh, thinks that the NOP should call out specifically educational impacts. And then also endorses the approach to increasing residential housing in the downtown area um, and on city parking lots. And so I will
open the presentation here. Bear with me one moment while I seems to be. Let me see if I can move back. Okay. All right. Thanks for your patience. So the purpose of this meeting is a scoping session uh, to receive comments on the scope and content of an environmental impact report, uh, which we call an EIR. And an EIR analyzes the effects of a proposed project on the physical environment in areas like traffic and air quality, um, greenhouse gas emissions, other topics as well. Uh, so it provides an, a scoping session provides an early opportunity to comment on topics that should be addressed in an EIR. And in particular, this EIR will be prepared to evaluate potential environmental effects of changes to the city's general plan. And the general plan is a guide to the city's vision for the future um, that informs local decisions about land use and development in various topic areas. And those topic areas are called elements. So for this particular project, we're looking at an update to the existing housing element and related rezonings and other zoning ordinance amendments, an update to the existing safety element and a new environmental justice element. There will be no project actions at this meeting. Um, as I mentioned, is it is to receive comments on the scope and content prior to um, really digging into the EIR. And more information about the EIR for the housing element update project will be provided in a presentation that will follow mine um, by the city's environmental consultant, ESA. So uh, the three elements that I, that I just referenced, um, we'll start out with the first one, the housing element update. The housing element is a state mandated element of the general plan, and it will cover an eight year planning period from 2023 to 2031, which is also referred to as the sixth cycle. And the housing element must analyze existing and projected housing needs and update goals, policies, objectives, and implementation programs for housing at all income levels uh, for the city. And the housing element must include an inventory of sites that permit housing development to meet a target set by the state. Um, and this target number, we refer to it as RENA, which stands for the Regional Housing Needs Allocation. So for the sixth for the sixth cycle, the city's arena is 2,946 units, and if we include a 30 percent buffer, the arena is 3,830 units. The California Department of Housing and Community Development advised that a buffer of additional units is necessary, uh, so that if one or more of the housing sites that we identify are developed at lower densities than expected, there's still a remaining supply of housing sites to meet arena during the eight-year planning period. If there is no buffer um, and then an identified site develops with non-housing project or at a density that's less than what was anticipated in the, in the housing element, the city could be required to identify new sites and amend the housing element. So it's important to include this buffer to avoid having to go back and reopen uh, the housing element later on. I would also note that while state law requires the housing element to include an inventory of housing sites and requires the city to zone the sites for multifamily housing, the city is not actually uh, in the position to develop and construct housing on these sites. The development is gonna, is gonna depend on the interests of the property owners and uh, market forces at work. So the second element that's being updated is the safety element. And the safety element is also a state mandated general plan element. It focuses on protection of the community from risks due to climate change, earthquakes, floods, fires, toxic waste, um, and other types of hazards. And it specifies the measures that the city will take to reduce the potential risks from those hazards. The reason that we are updating the safety element is to bring it into compliance with recent state law. Um, and so the things that will be evaluated um, as examples are addressing residential development evacuation routes in hazard areas, 
assessing local vulnerabilities to different climate hazards, and developing policies and actions towards climate adaptation and resiliency. The third component that I mentioned earlier on was an environmental justice element for the city's general plan. And this is the first uh, time that the city has had an environmental justice element in our, in our general plan. The purpose of the environmental justice element is to address unique or compounded health risks within disadvantaged communities, also called DACs, as defined by the state. And disadvantaged communities are areas throughout California that are most burdened by economic, health, and environmental issues. And so the types of burdens that could be experienced in these communities would include poverty, high unemployment, um, hazardous waste exposure, uh, air and water pollution, things like that. And the way, one way the state identifies these areas is by collecting and anal analyzing information from communities throughout the state. Cal EnviroScreen is an analytical tool created by the California Environmental Protection Agency, and it combines different types of census tract specific information into a score to determine which communities are the most um, burdened or disadvantaged. So in Menlo Park, um, according to Cal EnviroScreen, the Bell Haven neighborhood is considered a DAC. So measures that could be included in the environmental justice element as examples could be improving air quality and reduce, reducing pollution exposure, enhancing public facilities and infrastructure in the area, expanding food access, ensuring safe and sanitary housing, and promoting civic engagement in public decision-making. On December 8th of last year, the city council supported a preliminary land use scenario with multiple strategies to ensure that the city can meet its sixth cycle arena allocation. And that was really built upon the previous meetings um, that, that happened throughout the community, uh, meetings of city council, planning commission, housing commission. Um, and so some of these are familiar probably from uh, previous presentations that we've given at, at Planning Commission or if you've seen at City Council. Um, I'll walk you quickly through those scenarios. So this chart is, is basically an overview of the new housing needs um, that we have to meet through our arena. The top half of the chart um, is showing the sixth cycle arena requirement for Menlo Park broken down by income category. So you can see very low, low, moderate, above moderate, um, and a total units category. And then the bottom half of the chart shows arena credits um, that, that we can apply against the requirements. So with the adoption of the El Camino Real and Downtown Specific Plan, our fourth cycle arena in 2013, and the Connect Menlo General Plan update, we enabled over 5,000 new housing units in the city. Currently, there are seven major residential projects in the pipeline as either approved or pending housing developments that would provide over 3,600 new units. And these units, as well as smaller projects across the city, could potentially count towards Menlo Park's sixth cycle arena. Um, so you can see that on the pipeline projects uh, line here at the total of 3,647. And then there's another line for ADU credits. And so between 2018 and 2020, Menlo Park produced an average of 10.6 um, ADUs per year. And at that rate, we could anticipate about 85 units uh, during the sixth cycle housing element planning period. And so you see that total um, here under ADUs. So if we compare the arena credits at each of the income levels um, with the six cycle requirements and the 30% buffer added, um, you can see that we project enough uh, above moderate units to meet all of our requirements during the six cycle. So 1,669 required, we anticipate 3,061 units, so well above uh, the requirement there but new units would still be needed at the very low, low and moderate income affordability levels. So you can see down here, um, the credits in these income categories are not really enough to make up for the need, including the buffer 
So you end up with a total of 1,490 affordable units that are needed as uh, part of our net RENA and the income levels are broken out uh, on that last line. Based on historic trends in Menlo Park and the challenges and incentives that are typically needed to produce all affordable housing developments, it's unlikely that all housing opportunity sites that we've identified would be, adult, would be developed with 100% affordable units. And so because of that, the EIR would analyze up to 4,000 net new units to meet the city's RENA requirements. And that total could include a variety of opportunities, um, either through 100% affordable housing developments, mixed income developments, or market rate developments that include BMR units. And so the next couple of slides will give an overview of the strategies um, that would permit the 4,000 units that will be studied in the EIR. So the first strategy would be reuse housing opportunity sites from the current fifth cycle housing element that goes through 2023. And for those sites, we would allow buy right development for projects that include 20% or more affordable housing. Buy right development uh, means projects could be approved at the staff level and it would not require the additional rounds of um, review and approval by the planning commission or city council. And densities on those sites would be um, 30 dwelling units per acre or higher. The second strategy would be to increase permitted residential densities in a specific plan area. And we would set a minimum density in the specific plan area of 20 dwelling units per acre. And then allow at least 30 dwelling units per acre for development at the base level with potential increases in densities at the bonus level of development in a specific plan area. We would also remove the cap of 680 units in the specific plan area that exists now. And it would, it would open up more opportunities for housing um, around downtown and El Camino Real. And it would also allow residential development on the city owned parking plazas. So additional strategies would be to modify the affordable housing overlay which we call the AHO. Um, and that would allow up to 100 dwelling units per acre for 100% affordable housing developments and increase allowed densities for mixed income developments that offer more affordable units than the city's BMR requirements. Uh, another strategy would be to modify certain retail and commercial zoning district standards and allow residential uses in those areas and encourage mixed use development. Um, as with other strategies, the densities for these sites would be a minimum of 30 dwelling units per acre. And specifically, um, we're looking at the C2, C2A, C2B, C2, C2S, C4, and P districts to apply um, these modifications. And then the final strategy would be to remove the 10,000 square foot minimum lot size requirement for R3 zoned properties around downtown and allow those sites a density of up to 30 dwelling units uh, per acre as well. One additional item here is that the city council may also study a potential reduction of residential densities in the Bayfront area, which is city council district one and uh, make equivalent increases in densities in other areas of the city. And we're currently evaluating uh, the potential for that. Um, and so uh, that, that may be a, a future topic of discussion. <clears throat> so you can see here, um, we're showing on these maps, there's a series of four of them that I'll very quickly walk through. Um, but in total, we're looking at str these strategies would target over 70 sites as housing opportunity sites, and then rezonings would also allow new housing development or increased housing densities on over 800 parcels citywide. So this first map shows the housing opportunity sites in the Sharon Heights area, and these, this is Sand Hill Road uh, running faintly along here to help orient you. Um, but the sites are color coded uh, according to their size here. And then there's one which I believe is a gas station parcel um, off of the Sharon Heights shopping center that's separate, which would be a rezoned commercial only site. This next uh, map 
shows housing opportunity sites focused around the central area of the city, including downtown and El Camino Real, which this is El Camino Real running here, um, Santa Cruz Avenue running here, Ravenswood. And you can see um, in this area, we have a number of housing opportunity sites in the yellow, green, pink, and blue. But then in the lighter pink, you can also see there's a number of R3 properties um, around downtown that are less than 10,000 square feet, which would, which would have increased uh, residential densities applied. And then there are also um, some commercial only, there's one commercial only site here that you can see. And then the remainder of the teal are other, um, other downtown uh, specific plan properties that would see potential increases in uh, densities being allowed and the cap would be lifted on residential, more than 680 residential units in this area. This map shows development primarily along, primarily along Middlefield Road here and Willow Road. It's running kind of north to south here. Um, so you can see in this area, there's actually a number of uh, this lighter blue color. Um, these are the rezoned commercial only sites. So those would be modified to allow mixed use development. And then we also have a number of uh, potential opportunity, housing opportunity sites with, on larger um, parcels, predominantly along Middlefield Road, but there's a, a few also here um, off of Willow. And then the final map um, shows additional housing opportunity sites that were identified closer to the bay. So the bay is out here. Um, this is the Bayfront area, Bellhaven neighborhood. Um, this uh, Marsh Road running here, and then US 101. Um, so these are primarily office uses at moment. There's at the moment they're zoned for office, but uh, at the council meeting in, in December, they were identified as potential sites for additional study. And so we will be also evaluating those. Um, the flood school site is here, and then a couple of smaller parcels uh, located here off of. Pierce Road, I believe. Excuse me, Tom, just to know, yes. at least I, for one, am not seeing your cursor on any of the- um, Ah, sorry about that. Thank you for the, for uh, hopefully you've been able to follow along, but if, if you have questions afterward, um, we can always walk back to these maps. And so with that, um, that concludes my presentation. Um, Happy to turn it over for any clarifying questions, although I would note that Luke Evans of ESA, which is the city's environmental consultant, um, has some more details about the EIR process and uh, sort of the, the components of that. And so he will be walking you through that, whether you prefer that now or after clarifying questions. I think I would like to hear the other uh, presentation. I think uh, that might clear up some of the questions people have now. So let's do that and we'll have clarifying questions and we'll go to public comment. Okay, uh, hi everybody. This is uh, Luke Evans. I'm a project manager here at ESA and we've been hired by the city to prepare your environmental impact report. It's a big project and we're happy to do it and appreciate the opportunity. So it looks like Tom is booting up the presentation. There we go. Okay, great. Uh, Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. My presentation is gonna be pretty brief. Um, the real purpose of this thing is to get public input and also your input on specific environmental topics that you think we should look at that we might not otherwise think about. Um, and that's really the purpose of the scoping session is to, is to get that kind of input from you and members of the public. Uh, we're gonna go over, talk about the type of EIR this, this is gonna be. We're going to talk about this kind of the standard list of environmental issues that we that typically show up in an EIR that many of you are probably used to seeing. We'll go quickly through the environmental review process schedule, for lack of a better term, of, of where we're going to be and how this thing is going to play out over the next, I don't know, 11 months or so. And then we'll take comments from yourselves and members of the public. 
Uh, uh, next slide, please. So the purpose of scoping, as I as I said earlier, is really to, to get comments uh, from from the public and from people like yourselves to determine what the scope of the environmental document will be. Uh, certainly, there's a long list of issues, and we're going to go through some of those in a, in a minute here. Uh, there's a long list of issues that show up in every EIR that everybody is used to seeing. But what we really want to hear is we want to hear specific information that you may have or uh, members of the public may have that that we should look at in particular. Uh, so some of those things we want to get information on from you all would be key environmental issues of concern, uh, any mitigation measures you might have or may, may think of that may help us or reduce or avoid impacts, and then potential alternatives. Uh, CEQA does require that we do look at alternatives. So there are different ways to get at this housing element update. So we want to hear about some ideas for those, if you have any. And you know, the ultimate question is, in short, what should we be looking at in the EIR? What should we, what should we be analyzing? Next slide, please. So this is a program EIR. And for those of you who've been in this for a while, you, you know the difference between a program EIR and a project EIR. This is a program, it's big, it covers a, a large program. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily cover any specific projects. As of now, there are no applications for these opportunity sites. There's no specific project that's being advanced. So we're going to look at this at a pretty high level. Uh, and so the, the EIR will be a subsequent EIR to the Connect Menlo Plan EIR, which was prepared in 2016. There's a lot of work went into that, and we want to piggyback off off of that to the extent that we can. Uh, we don't want to reinvent the wheel uh, unless we have to. So that's really uh, the, the purpose of the subsequent EIR. Next slide, please. So as I said earlier, this is a typical list of, of topics that would show up in just about any EIR. These, these are derived from the CEQA guidelines. Uh, and for the most part, we're going to be looking at all of the topics in the CEQA guidelines, as you can see here in this top section. There are a couple that really don't apply to the city or certainly don't apply to the, uh, the opportunity sites and the areas that are under, under consideration for the housing element update. And those would be agricultural and forestry and then uh, mineral resources. But all these ones up top would, would uh, apply and, and would get the full treatment in the EIR. Next slide, please. So here is a very broad timeline. And I wanna draw everybody's attention to what, what's in the bottom there, the red part. This is our deadline, January 31st. Uh, that's when we have to submit an adopted housing element to HCD. Otherwise, uh, bad things can happen and you want to avoid those. Uh, so here we are right now, we are, we are in the draft scoping session. We're, in, we're kind of coming up on the tail end of the, of the notice of preparation comment period. We've gotten a couple comments that Tom mentioned earlier. I expect we'll get a, quite a bit more over the next week or so in the, before the NOP comment period closes. And then uh, for the next few months, we'll be uh, working on the draft EIR. We'll be doing the analysis. We'll be, we'll be doing the traffic study, doing the air quality study, the noise study, bio, all those things that, that we'd normally do. Uh, then we publish the draft EIR, we go out on the street for 45 days, and sometime during that, there would be a comment session uh, where people could, where the members of the public could comment on the draft EIR. And uh, at the end of that, we, uh, with, with a lot of assistance from the city, would respond to any comments that were received on the EIR. And then it would go, the, the combination draft and the responses to comments would be kind of melded together into a final EIR, and that would go before uh, the city council for certification. And so that is the overview of the process. Once again, there's our deadline. We've got, it sounds like a long time, sounds like we've got a whole year, but there's a lot of things that have to happen. And so it's gonna really take everybody kind of pulling together to, to get this thing wrapped up in time. Uh, next slide, please. Tom put this slide together that just basically has the layout of or, or the information that, that folks need to, 
to comment. Of course, I'm taking verbal comment here tonight, uh, but people can also submit email, written comments, lots of different ways to uh, get their comments into us. And then there's also gonna be an upcoming community meeting, February 12th, uh, to go over some of these strategies that Tom talked about earlier. So that's that's my uh, presentation. Uh, happy to take any questions. I know Tom Tom's happy to take questions too. Uh, it's at what point, I guess, uh, Mr. Chairman, you know, at what point would we open this up for public comment? But maybe we just want to go through questions first. So, I'll yeah. What I would like to do is entertain any clarifying questions from the commission now uh, for either you or Mr. Paz. Uh, then I want to open it up to public comment and then I'll return it to the commission for further comments and questions. So if we have any clarifying questions now, uh, this is the time. I'm not seeing any, you guys must be very clear. Let's, uh, let's open it up for public comment. Mr. Pruder, do we have any hands raised now? Yes, thank you, Chair Doran. Um, at this time, I do see one hand raised, so I can go ahead and get that started. But as a reminder for members of the public to please raise your hand with the hand icon on your Zoom interface or press star nine if you're calling by phone to be able to provide public comment. I have two commenters now, so I will begin with the first one, uh, if, if that sounds all right with you, Chair Doran. Please. Okay, so we have our first commenter uh, who goes by the name of uh, Misha Sillen. I'm going to allow you to speak. If you could please state your jurisdiction and your name at the beginning, um, that would be great. And you have three minutes to speak as well. Thank you very much. Hello, uh, this is Misha. Good evening. Thank you for taking my comment. I'm a resident of Allied Arts. I'm the one that sent in a very long email comment earlier today going over the sites in the NOP and comparing them to the previous uh, fifth cycle element and just kind of drilling into some of the sites that represent the largest number of uh, units of housing that we expect to be built in the sixth cycle. Um, I realize this comment isn't related to the uh, environmental impact of the sites, but I'm kind of still just stepping back to the main issue. Um, and the reason I spent a lot of hours on this and, and you know wrote that up is because I do feel that housing is a very important issue to Menlo Park and to our country. I think that um, housing has many different implications ranging from you know nationwide to local. Um, and at the local level, I'm concerned about you know not building enough housing leading to friends and families feeling stressed, priced out, having to commute from very far away. Uh, it does impact you know, climate change and traffic as we discussed earlier with the Facebook project, for example, if we continue to build lots of office buildings without housing um, for the people that work in those offices, they're gonna be driving in from elsewhere, which causes uh, greenhouse gas emissions, et cetera. Um, so I think just my main comment is that based on what I saw on the list of sites, uh, it seems like very there's, there hasn't been any evidence that these sites are gonna lead to a lot of housing being built. Uh, most of the sites are office buildings on Sand Hill Road or Middlefield uh, that are occupied by very wealthy venture capitalist firms or uh, startups with a lot of money. Um, I don't believe there's been any evidence shown that these companies are looking to move out or that you know it's lucrative for the property owners to convert their large office buildings to housing. And so if we are serious about tackling some of what I think are you know, biggest problems, especially in our region, like homelessness, climate change, et cetera, um, and we agree that we need to build more housing, I think we do need to spend more time on the list of sites and make sure that they're realistic. And if they're not adding more sites to the list, um, and you know, from the process perspective, we've seen um, HCD at the state level rejecting a lot of housing elements from other cities like Redondo Beach, Beverly Hills, Davis, that are unrealistic. And so I do fully expect that the same you know, level of reasoning will be applied to our housing element. And as it stands now, it will be rejected. So I think it does still make sense to go back and try to um, make it more realistic. Thank you for taking the time to uh, listen to my comment, and I hope you read the uh, written comment I submitted as well. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. And we have a second commenter, Chair Doran. I will introduce them at this time. Their name is uh, Pam Jones. And uh, you also have an opportunity to speak. You will be given three minutes uh, to provide public comment. And I will be letting you speak shortly. If you could please provide your name and jurisdiction uh, at the beginning of your comments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pamela Jones, resident of Menlo Park, Belhaven neighborhood for almost 50 years. Um, one, I'd like to know what kind of outreach is being done in District 1 so that residents that are interested um, can participate. And number two, uh, given that there would be no further construction over here under the environmental justice um, and how our community is designated, do we still as a neighborhood need to make comments to ensure that that aspect of the um, housing element is actually adhered to? Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Uh, Chair Dorn, as an update, I see no other hands raised. We can wait a moment longer if you'd like, um, or we could just go ahead and close the public comment. Let's, uh, let's give it just a few seconds here. No other hands raised? That's correct, there are no other hands. Okay, I wanna close public comment now and bring it back to commission for further comments uh, for any questions that the commission has. Um, would anyone like to lead off? Commissioner DeCarty. Yeah, I, I just have a couple of clarifying questions, but I appreciated the opportunity for public comment first since people have been waiting a long time. Um, I have three clarifying questions. Um, on the 4,000 number, uh, for purposes of this discussion, how relevant is 4,000 versus 2,000 versus 6,000 for the EIR? How important is that 4,000 number in specific for the EIR? Uh, I can answer that. Uh, for the most part, what you, you can kind of almost think of this, of, of what we're going to do is an envelope of possibility. And another way to think about it might be a worst case scenario. That's not a precise term, but it's one way to think about how we're going to look at this. We recognize that some of these housing sites may change, you know, as a result of public interaction and public opinion, public comment over, over the period of the housing element update. Uh, we might find that some of the housing sites have environmental impacts that, that are not acceptable and they may drop off or some may go up. But what we're looking at is an envelope. It's kind of a worst case scenario uh, of analysis. So 4,000 is, is kind of the number that we're at currently and that we think would capture the, the scope of likely impacts associated with the housing element update. And so that's, does that answer your question? Uh, I guess it answers my question, but if I disagree that 4,000 is the outer edge of that, um, I think you said worst case scenario, then that feels important. So, yeah. and this would be to the, like the, the good comment and letter we had before about assumptions about what gets built uh, you look at the maps and you look at impacts and opportunities in the community that at least geographically are unevenly spread, those kinds of questions. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like that actually is material. Do I have that right? Uh, it, it is material. I, I, guess, I guess I would just caution that you don't want to make the number too big that you overestimate the impacts. Uh, so it is, it is a question of finding the, the, the perfect kind of the sweet spot. And I think based on the, the arena allocation plus the buffer, the 4,000 number uh, was, was the agreed upon number that would make the most sense for this particular housing element update. Uh, if, if, if anybody else wants to, if Tom, if you want to chime in on that, uh, please feel free for how we, how we got there. Yeah, I think you, you handled the answer correctly, Luke. It was uh, really looking at the, Arena requirement plus the buffer 
um, which gets us, you know, the 3,800 units and uh, allowing even a little bit more of uh, padding there for different development potentials, um, whether those are 100% affordable projects, mixed development or market rate with BMR units. Um, so that's, that's how we landed on it. Okay, that's helpful. And my second question was, does SB9 um, uh, relate to this in any way, how we're going to implement or um, understanding state uh, opportunities and or mandates for affordable housing? And what assumptions are being made for that in this whole mix? So we haven't incorporated um, SB9. This is based on really the strategies that um, I walked through and SB9 is, is uh, as a allowance by the state under state law, um, we have not incorporated potential development um, there into the strategy. Great, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Barnes. Get your hands raised. I do, thank you. So I've got a, first a clarifying question um, and then a question to, the, to Luke, if that would be permissible. First clarifying question, would it be possible to go back to the slide that had the downtown uh, primarily on it? Yeah, so I would ask um, whoever's controlling the presentations, if you could reload the presentation I gave earlier. And as, as they're doing that, my, my question is this. Um, so many of the, the lots that are, for instance, off of Santa Cruz and in that, in that area, you see all the, um, I'm sorry, that's, that's Sharon, so go two more, I think. The one that's downtown, um, like Santa Cruz Avenue. Yep, right there. Awesome. Uh, what can be super problematic about uh, you know, development there is you need to do some assemblage on these, on these smaller parcels to get any type of, any type of size. Um, and then the other piece is the, the downtown specific plan and its development standards you know, by way of calling out certain allocations of retail and then 50 in, in office and residential, then step back. So uh, both the zoning piece of it and the development standards piece of it uh, would need to really undergo uh, large changes as it relates to uh, getting any type of scale in these areas. When, when we talk about the pink and it says R3 zoned parcels in upzoning, th does that contemplate, for instance, going back into the downtown specific plan and re-looking at the development standards, which are height and which are setbacks and which are different things? Right, it 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 does. Um, you know, density is is a key here, but um, I think we're still evaluating all of the different modifications that we would need to make to the development standards in the downtown specific plan area. Um, but it, that could be part of the equation to make sure that we get, you know, a, a really uh, feasible density and and projects that can that can be built that are realistic. Which is which is quite a lift to modify that specific plan. Just um, okay. Thank you for that. Um, the other question is to um, Mr. Evans, and I don't know the answer to this, so I'm going to make my best run at trying to formulate some some coherent thoughts around it. Um, what I'm trying to figure out as we talk about uh, increased densities is uh, the impact on schools and uh, how potentially that could be reflected in 
uh, the EIR and, and, and allow me to kind of walk through this. So when we did the circulation element in 2016, when the, when the city did it, uh, you know, at that time, the, the, the state was transitioning, getting ready to transition from VMT to LOS. What happened was through the process of the general plan advisory committee, there was a thrust from the community to say, hey, wait a minute, BMT is great. And that's a state mandated direction we're going in. But we in Menlo Park, we like the idea of level of service. We like to understand at intersection X, if Y happens, then I'm gonna have to wait X months longer uh, now than before due to you know Z development type of thing. You know, if I think of, of education and uh, you know, educational level of service. I mean, we get to a situation where we are adding, you know, uh, bodies to whatever school district it is. Like we take, for instance, Menlo Park School District, and every additional body is an impact on the capital budget, facilities, on operating uh, budgets, um, and on, you know, capital budget, facilities budgets, and operating budgets. Uh, the ability to have a report out on developments that is in a way creating a nexus between when you do X for development, it has a Y impact. And I know like you do an FIA. So you've got uh, if, if some Menlo portal down in, down in um, the Bayfront area, right? You get uh, impacts, which shows great for the Ravenswood School District, it does X. For Menlo Park School District, it does Y, or whatever. Or excuse me, for Sequoia Union, it does Y. How is it that this concept of level of service, this concept of educational level of service, could be baked into the uh, the process for uh, reporting out? with some type of metric as agreed upon with, like, for instance, a school district to not rectify it. Because when you're talking affordable housing, you're talking to other pieces, it's very, very hard. You can't, you cannot do something which is going to preclude development of, you know, certain, uh, you know, AMI levels, but at the same time, uh, allowing for there to be the acknowledgement and then course correction or taking steps necessary to understand what those impacts are. So maybe the city can, as an environmental impact, go back and look at, should it be providing general funds uh, to be able to, to offset some of these impacts? Should it go back and look at the community amenity fund that comes in and look at how that gets allocated? Uh, is there a place in this process, much like level of service remaining for vehicular traffic to have education level of service, and what we're doing in this um, housing element. Could you talk at all to that? I can, and I, I think you may be disappointed in the answer, at, at least from the CEQA perspective. Uh, CEQA is really concerned with a project's impacts on the physical environment. Uh, issues like, it, it is interested in things like uh, school facility uh, capacity and, you know, other public service metrics, say, for instance, response times from emergency service providers, things like that. But it's only concerned with those issues within the context of how remedying those issues, those, those identified problems would impact the environment. So for instance, if you were to have a project that were to introduce a substantial number of students to the local school district and that would require that school district to construct a new school or expand a new school. CEQA would be interested in the impacts of doing that, of constructing that school, of addressing those shortfalls with existing facilities. It Just because there is an exceedance in capacity uh, from a school, for instance, that is not, that in itself is not an environmental impact under CEQA. Uh, it's really what you're gonna have to do to address that issue. That is the environmental impact. And I know there's some nuance there. Sometimes it gets a little confusing, but 
the, the, the CEQA case law is pretty clear on that, that that's really what they're focused on is the environmental impact providing that additional service. Now, the problem is with this kind of project, you know, and I use the term project loosely because it's not a project like someone's, like one of the ones we, we heard earlier this evening, you know, those are real projects. Those are being advanced. There, there's plans on the table for those. At this point, we don't know what future projects, real projects are gonna look like. We don't know where they're gonna go necessarily. We don't know what the densities are, et cetera. So it's really hard for us to project out what environmental impacts are gonna be for, for those kinds of general, very broad program level projects. Uh, so does, it, does that answer your question? Uh, probably not as, as, as well as you'd hope, but uh, tell me if I can elaborate some more. At the risk of paraphrasing, th this is not the home for that. In other words, your, this EIR is not the home for for teasing this out in creating, in effect, a nexus relationship between uh, X development and Y impact on uh, the educational system. Um, and having, and it doesn't have a home in the housing element, it, or, or said differently, you're on the EIR side. Uh, however, this might have a home in the housing element itself, which the content of which exists separately from the EIR component of it. That is, that's accurate, yes, sir. Okay, so it may have a political life, but it doesn't have an EIR life, this that's particular. Right. And, and there line. is a distinction. And sometimes that doesn't, yeah. people are frustrated by that, by that distinction, but uh, that, that is, I think you described it pretty accurately. Thank you. So I will close by saying as important as, you know, um, Many other types of justice, uh, I think educational justice is very important and the, the systemic inability to fund our education. Um, it's easy, I'm not talking to you, Mr. Evans, I'm just, just in closing, you know, it's easy. I, I overreact to cars on the street in my God-given right to drive my cut list down any particular street at 60 miles an hour with any other traffic. I do, however, get animated over education, and the lack of funding for education and the systemic um, malnourishment and starving of it um, and who we look to to fund it. Uh, so thank you for that. And I think the housing element process has a home for this. It's just not with you. And I appreciate your response. Thank you. We have other commissioners that want to speak. Mr. Riggs. Thank you. Um, trying to keep my comments to EIR scoping in this case. Um, I, with all due respect to my friend Pam Jones, I do feel that the EIR should not rule out any locations um, for housing um, in, at the very least, um, housing which has already been put in uh, our zoning. Um, <clears throat> I will not. Um, burden this meeting with the reasons um, other than to say that um, if you approve development in an area and want to delete the housing portion, that leaves commercial. And in this environment, that means office buildings. And I, for one, would not like to encourage um, further construction of office buildings um, in that area or necessarily any um, particularly transportation impacted area. Um, then I would like to respond to a good point made by a fellow commissioner about the smaller lots downtown uh, being relatively unlikely for development. I think the way that we look at the smaller lots is, you might say, halfway down to ADUs. 
um, ADUs, which by the way, sh in my opinion, should be figured as more than 10 per year. If last year 10 were built, given the recent and continuing changes in state law, I would expect 15 to be built in 2022 and 25 to be built in 2024. Um, but if you look at the downtown lots as sort of between size lots, the only thing restraining their construction is that city council after 18, almost 20 years has yet to move forward with a parking structure, which um, was integral to the downtown specific plan. Um, and it still has not moved forward. Um, so I think that is still uh, a reasonable housing uh, expectation downtown um, once the roadblock is removed. Um, and then um, uh, while I personally would oppose any further development on Willow Road, that is not an EIR issue. Um, what I think is an EIR issue is that we are assuming that Menlo Park and the other cities on the peninsula and the Bay Area will continue to drive housing need. And I very much hope, at least for my own city, that that is not the case. I don't see, and I have challenged others to tell me, those who should be able to give me a good argument, I don't see why significantly increasing the size of Menlo Park is a benefit to the residents. I'm not talking about the theoretical future residents. I'm talking about the residents who are here. We are Menlo Park. People who may come in the future, they are not Menlo Park. They are where they live now. And if a relentless and continuing increase in the size and density of our town is not benefiting those of us who are here, then why are we assuming that this is the inevitable path forward? So with that in mind, and I realize this is an uphill request, uh, I believe there should be an EIR alternate case that is based on significantly reduced housing need from that which is projected by the state. I realize that <clears throat> the charge here is for a housing element to meet the Bay Area requirement. However, I think the EIR will be more useful to Menlo Park, and we are Menlo Park, not the Bay Area and not the state, if it includes an alternative, which is for a reduced future housing need. Uh, that's my suggestion, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else on the commission would speak this time? Mr. Riccardi. I appreciate the time and the presentation. Um, on the 4,000 number, I think that's low, um, but I will take your word that 4,000 works for the EIR. Um, I think the, you know, we can look at the history of what we have for um, housing that is at market rate and what we get at BMR units and extrapolate out of that. I appreciate the comments on ADUs, but we continue to approve ADUs that clearly are not going for affordable housing uh, again and again and again. So I think those assumptions need to be checked everywhere. And I think they're important uh, because ultimately it's a question around density and it's a question around spread. Um, and we need to look at all of that. Um, uh, I'm a huge fan of density. I think density is what gets us prosperity and gets us a thriving downtown in this mix. Um, relative to the EIR, um, 
a program EIR is in place for a long time. I assume this one's in place for the duration of this sixth arena until we get a seventh. So what assumptions do you make around climate change um, or around changes in understanding of impacts over time that lock in? You don't need to answer particularly, but it's something that gets frustrating when we look at a specific project and you've got a locked in assumption on some impact that's based on data that's four, five, six years old, which has been updated. And so when the final ER is presented, would love to understand how we assure that those assumptions are actually relevant to a future case. And unfortunately, those changes happen fast these days and nobody can predict them. Um, so that's a comment for input. Um, another one is especially, I'd love that we have an EJ element. I think that's fabulous um, with the housing element. Um, and as we're looking at uh, impacts on folks to make sure that we're looking at indoor stuff in addition to outdoor stuff, indoor air quality, those sorts of things, hugely important. Um, and also when we're thinking about um, adaptation issues, that we think about adaptation issues that also serve mitigation purposes. The first rule of holes is to stop digging. And so reducing use uh, that creates um, fossil fuel emissions seems like a good idea. So if you look at something in areas of our community that are gonna be particularly susceptible to heat islands, cool roof programs, canopy, that kind of stuff, hope there's an overemphasis on looking at the, that intersection and that the EIR could be helpful in that mix. But the two main things that I wanna say about the EIR, the first one is, is that our EIR process is broken. Um, and continually we have EIRs that present the Goldilocks uh, scenario, which is there's only three things to consider. Consideration number one is that you do uh, absolutely nothing. Consideration number two is that you do absolutely the maximum of everything else. And lo and behold, you end up taking the thing in the middle because it threads the needle on protecting the environment and whatever the need was that the project was created for to begin with. And that is entirely unhelpful for anybody in the community to be able to actually extrapolate and to be able to use it for sunshine and for uh, being able to um, uh, learn more about what impacts are and how they think about a particular project. Uh, and so with that in mind, I uh, respectfully disagree with um, my fellow commissioner um, about uh, Commissioner Riggs and his comment on housing and density. But I do think looking at a fourth makes sense. And I think it's in this space around parking. So we have these assumptions around people and we're thinking about units and people and density and people. But the fact is there's a trailing element, which is the assumption around the cars that they come with and what we build for. Um, and time and time again, we talk to developers who do not want to build the parking because they don't need it. Um, and parking is a disaster for housing. It's a disaster for the embedded carbon in cement. It's a disaster for everything other than the fact that this isn't the Jetsons and we can't take our car and put it in our briefcase and carry it with us to work, which would be the best thing. So I think it's really important that we get a program EIR that takes a look at the opportunity set for massively reducing parking um, so that we can understand what the potential benefit is on pieces of property that actually build more housing for people so we have density for people and not density for cars and parking cars. So we have to be able to figure out how to do this. And this is a huge and important element in this mix. So as you consider this, um, I have said this before that I will not vote to say that an EIR is adequate without looking at alternative with massively reduced parking in that mix. I think it's particularly important to look at in this one um, because um, it creates an opportunity for us to actually get more housing for people as opposed to for cars and a positive feedback loop in that mix. So thanks for the time and attention on this. I'm looking forward to the rest of this process. Thank you. So um, it is uh, approximately 1040 now. We will need to stop at 11 unless we want to continue. Just want to keep that in front of everybody as we continue. Does anyone else want to speak? Anyone else from the commission? Questions, further comments? Commissioner Harris. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation, both of the presentations. Um, so as far as the EIR is concerned, um, I want to uh, kind of dovetailing on what um, Commissioner Ducardi said. 
I would like to know how you would um, analyze the positive environmental impacts of infill housing um, and, and how, how that might work, if I may. Sure, I, as far as discussing the positive aspects of infill, I think there, there as, as I'm sure you know, there are lots and lots of laws that the legislature is, has, has uh, put in place over the last 10 years or so to encourage infill housing. Um, and a lot of those things, a lot of those laws revolve around, for instance, streamlining, making it easier to develop in housing, making it less expensive, making the process easier, less hoops to jump through, et cetera. So clearly uh, the legislature anyway has, has recognized infill housing as a positive thing, as something that, that should be happening. Uh, the extent that CEQA really doesn't play up benefits particularly. Uh, if we were talking about a federal project under NEPA, which is the National Environmental Policy Act, which is kind of the, the federal version of CEQA, they do put an emphasis on benefits. And it's actually something you play up in the analysis if, if there is in fact a benefit to something. Um, CEQA really doesn't, doesn't go there. It kind of says, is there gonna be a negative? It's, let's just call it a very negative look. It, are there negative impacts that are gonna happen? And that's, that's kind of what we focus on. And the answer to that is always kind of a yes or no. There, it either is, it's, it's either negative or it's just nothing. It just is what it is. Um, so is did that answer your question? Is there, is there anything that you would? So, so I guess in other words, um, if a, an alternative where most of the housing is infill housing is going to be less bad than the housing other places. I, I, you know, you use the word worst case scenario. I, I don't know what you mean by that. By that, I meant that that was, that's kind of the envelope of our analysis. In other words, we're looking at 4,000 units, even though, and, and this, this may actually help answer some of the other questions. I think that, uh, Commissioner Ducardi was asking about, about that very same question. Remember, we're looking at an eight-year program here. And we don't have our crystal ball. We don't know who's what developers are going to come along, what affordable housing subsidies are going to come along, et cetera. So at the end of the eight years, we don't know exactly how many housing units are actually going to get built in the city. We, we just have no way of knowing that. Uh, the 4,000 units is a big number. I think, I think most people would agree that if 4,000 units were, were to be constructed in the city in, in eight years, that would, be a, that would be a big number. The answer of what's actually gonna be built is probably gonna be less than that, realistically, right? So uh, when I say worst case scenario, that's kind of what I mean. We're looking at the upper limits of what could happen. Uh, the answer may be somewhere lower than that when it's all said and done at the end of eight years, you know, we'll find out. But our, what we don't wanna do is we don't wanna, we don't wanna analyze at a lesser level and then find that before the eight years are up, you're already bumping into that level and then you've gotta do more analysis and you gotta jump through more hoops, et cetera. Um, does, does that help? Does that help explain? Yeah, I, got, I, I guess I'm, a little uncomfortable with, with the description of um, worst case scenario. We're trying to build housing here. Yeah. And so saying that the worst case scenario is that we built too much housing feels, I realize that you're saying it from an environmental standpoint, but I'm, I'm kind of uncomfortable with that, that use of, of phrase. Um, so I know that what we're trying to do is to do this housing in, an environmental way. And one way is to um, consider less parking um, per Commissioner Ducardi and to consider the infill um, housing. So I'm just hopeful that those are going to help us. And I'm, I don't, I'm a little unclear also what the different, wh like what, what would be the alternative? Um, 
like we have to build this housing. So, so what is, how, how do you determine what the alternative would be given the guardrails that we need to meet with Rena? Are you suggesting that you would do one scenario where it's 8,000 and one, th one that it's 4,000? Like, how are, how are you going to come up with this alternate scenario? Alternatives are actually driven in most cases by what kind of impacts we find when we do the analysis. Alternatives are kind of the last thing you look at when you write an EIR because, because generally they're constructed around the bad things you've identified with your project. And so alternatives are directed towards how can you reduce, minimize, avoid those impacts that you've identified. So in many cases, alternatives would be looking at um, something that would reduce some of those negative things that, that we found out during the analysis. Does that help? Okay, yeah. Um, I do have a couple other comments. I really appreciate the comments um, both from uh, Ms. Jones and from uh, Misha. And I, I too have had the issue of, I don't, I don't necessarily understand how this list of sites is going to get us to where we need to be, given that drilling down on them, I see a lot of, um, you know, office parks or other places that are fully utilized. And I just don't, I'm a little bit concerned that we're just not even going to get to where we need to get to. Um, so I, my question, I guess this is to staff, is at what point in this process does staff or the M group or whoever it may be contact the, the landlords or the owners um, and try to understand and developers to try to understand how realistic each of those sites that we've um, added to our list are with respect to housing and what's the likelihood that, that you know, what, what kind of incentive would, would the incentive that we're providing some of these zoning incentives, is that gonna be enough? Or, you know, kind of how are we going to determine that? And at what stage in this process? Because I feel like we're already here at the EIR, but I'm not sure that we've really done that work. And so I'm just wondering, when does that work happen? So we have done outreach um, to different property owners that would be affected. Um, we've, we've sent out mailings um, to each of the property owners um, for all of the sites that, that were seen on the maps earlier and we have received contact from a small number i would say um although even today i'm, I'm still noticing inquiries coming in um and, and people wanting to talk to us about their sites and so um it's it's an ongoing process and and as we get feedback from individuals that would affect uh whether or not the site would be viable for housing um we are we are making those updates and making notes on uh on that information as it comes along but we have been having outreach events as well um we have upcoming community meetings uh community meeting number five is going to be um february 12th and then even after that we're, we're going to be turning to another community meeting uh shortly thereafter um so on outreach is, is really an ongoing process and we we have been making attempts to reach all of the various property owners um, about this but uh does that help well i'm just wondering bit? okay so i got a mail i'm an, i'm a property owner i got a mailer and i'm like oh, i'm not interested i mean at what point do you actually speak with that like try to contact them maybe in a different way or be or make sure like that we have this list that's that is going to work for us. Right. So yeah, we, we've we've with so many properties um, that we're evaluating, uh, we have relied on mailings up at this point, but we may look into further outreach um, as we as we continue to progress through the process um, to try to make contact. Um, but we are also trying to remain carefully within the HCD criteria that are set out for sites that, that, uh, they say are, that the state says are viable for affordable housing. And so that's why we've, we've sort of tuned in on these sites that are, uh, 
of a certain size, more than a half an acre, um, less than 10 acres in size, uh, et cetera, the various criteria. And so um, we've tried to identify all of those opportunities across the city um, and we're doing our best for outreach, but um, also trying to ma maintain sites that HCD says they believe are viable as well. In the case that we can't make contact with the property owner for whatever reason. Okay. Um, all right. So I I do want to. Um, well, I guess I don't I don't have a lot more questions on EIR at this point. I have a lot more other questions. So I'll let somebody else talk. So if anyone else has questions or comments on the EIR. Um, I think we need to bear in mind kind of how the EIR fits into everything else that's happening. And this is not housing element, right? This is the EIR scoping session. So if anyone else has comments on that, now is the time. <clears throat> not seeing any. So um, I'm gonna close this scoping session and um, move on to the final item on our agenda tonight, informational items. Uh, Ms. Senmeyer has two future meetings listed uh, on the agenda. Are there anything, is there anything else that uh, you wanna share with us, Ms. Sandmeyer? Good evening, this is Deanna Chow, uh, the Assistant Community Dele Development Director. Ms. Sandmeyer did log off um, for the evening and I'm here with you. Um, so yes, we do have, two uh, upcoming city uh, planning commission meetings on the 14th and 28th. There are a couple of items um, that we're potentially targeting a uh, study session for a new project in the Bayfront area, um, potentially modifications to Citizen M, the hotel um, that was approved a few years ago. And then um, we will be bringing back the housing element annual progress report, which is um, an, an annual review that we do on our existing housing element that is due to the state housing and community development department April 1st. So we'll be taking that back to um, the planning commission, housing commission, and then the city council. So um, that's targeted for the latter meeting in February. And I think that's uh, kind of the highlights for the next two meetings. Of, of course, things can change, but I think um, we're, we're targeting um, some of those items. Thank you. I see Commissioner Riggs has his hand raised. Yes, thank you. Um, I didn't wanna leave the meeting um, without addressing um, what happened on one of our earlier projects. Um, specifically the requirement for a four foot fence at the front of a lot uh, being defined as in the front setback of the lot rather than uh, being defined from the public right of way. Um, there may be logic to that that I don't follow, but um, as far as I know, the only intent of that reduction in fence height was to address the public right of way in which case that particular part of the zoning ordinance is miswritten. Um, I'm curious, <clears throat> since that is normally handled by creating a use permit rather than editing the ordinance, I'm curious what other elements of our chapter 16 lead to uh, the requirement for a use permit to correct the wording each time a project comes up. At the very least, I would like to ask uh, through the chair that we consider an agenda item to bring these zoning edits forward um, and address uh, a few nuisance items. Um, as I said, during the hearing, um, as a participant, I find it particularly embarrassing that something that probably needed editing back in 1997 continues to uh, bring a, a project forward that actually had to be continued 
Um, and if it had been handled better, it still would have been uh, added paperwork and a nuisance, a little bit too reminiscent of Charles Dickens, frankly. And I, I would just, you know, as a member of the Menlo Park team, so to speak, I'd like to see some of these things cleaned up. So um, if, if that's a reasonable request uh, to just estimate, you know, maybe just um, uh, uh, verbal history among the longer term planners, what items come forward and, and present this kind of issue and can those items, even if it's only the one fence item, um, be agendized for a little cleanup? Well, I would just say, you mentioned, would the chair be inclined to put that on the agenda? I would. <laughs> so I think we'll have to figure out a way to firm that up uh, and maybe we can work with uh, the staff offline to, uh, to do that, to help define what the agenda item would be. Um, Mr. Barnes, you're, uh, you're on mute. I was going to say, hi, Deanna. Good to see you. Haven't seen you in a while. Uh, housekeeping question. And this came up uh, last week. Uh, the good news is, is the city now has a super fancy website that looks good, has a great user interface. Uh, maybe I'm the old guy in the room, but the new, the way we get agendas now are one agenda without any hyperlinks. And it's, you know, it could be 200 pages of just a scroll through of the different agenda items within the overall agenda. And it's, you know, it's just hard to get through. Is there a way to reintroduce an agenda and with the agenda item we had before, a hyperlink so you could take that particular agenda item. And there was one staff report that was self-contained and another staff report that was self-contained. Right now they all run together in just one big Mambo packet. And, you know, just as a volunteer and trying to manage my time and get through the stuff, it's really hard. Um, so to the extent that you can uh, advocate for that to IT or whomever puts this together, uh, from a usability standpoint, I would really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I'll just interject, actually. There is a way to do this. Um, if you click on the icon in the upper left corner, you'll get a table of contents on the left uh, with a list of the staff reports. And you can scroll down that and click on each one of them and get to the staff report. So there is a way to do it. Um, what I find frustrating is uh, once you're in that staff report, I'm typically going back and forth between the drawings and the staff report and up and down exhibits. And it's easy to overshoot and you go past the one that you're looking at back into the one before it and you go back down and you overshoot again, you're in the next one. Uh, so that was still a problem, but, but there's a table of contents and now I'll let Ms. Chow respond. No, right, no. I like them to be pack, each his own packet, I guess, for purposes of delineation. Thank you. Yes, no, thank you for the feedback. And this is, uh, we're excited to have our new webpage and certainly evolving with it. Um, we are, we'll take your feedback. Um, and I think we are trying to make improvements along the way. So as Chair Doran mentioned, um, there is the table of contents feature. So in the PDF document itself on the left-hand side, you can uh, hit the lower button and it becomes in a table format. And then within each of those items, you can actually hit the little triangle uh, or greater than less than sign. So, and then below that, it also lists out each of the attachments. So that is a, a nice feature that you can jump to the attachment. If you have not seen that, that is helpful. Um, and we are now uh, hyperlinking the uh, staff report to the agenda. So like past staff reports, there is a hyperlink, but it is not um, I think Commissioner Barnes, you wanted sort of its own seven page document. It is part of still the, the full packet, but at least it's hyperlinked directly to that, that particular item. So there's a few different ways that you can um, accomplish getting to a particular item. So you can hyperlink through the agenda itself. You can scroll through the table format and jump to the agenda item by, by each line item. And then within each of the items, you can uh, jump to uh, the attachments as well. So hopefully that provides some ease in, in use. 
I'm going to recognize Commissioner Riggs and remind him that it's 10:59, so we have a minute. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, I'll just briefly uh, say I echo the chair's um, preference to be able to go back to a specific page that you were looking at in a document. And what is currently on the system doesn't allow you to readily do that. Uh, I like to toggle between. Um, and by the way, for, for my own purposes, I still take pencil notes during the meeting, which requires me to print out at least a few pages. And frankly, I've been donating printer ink to the commission for about a year and a half. So I, I would appreciate being able to navigate um, conveniently. And then just in case, um, uh, Deanna, you're not aware. It's been eight or 10 weeks that um, IT has theoretically uh, been working to make sure that I get the uh, biweekly invitation to these meetings. I have not gotten them since somewhere around November. I don't know who's working on it or how hard they're working on it, but pardon me for saying at this point that it's getting old. Um, and so that's it. Thank you for listening, and I agree. Good to see you again, Deanna. Okay. <clears throat> well, on that note, we're out of time. So thanks, everybody. I'm going to adjourn, adjourn the meeting. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, everybody. Be well. Good night.